What is every Smash character's best move? A seemingly simple question, but the answer ended up being a bit harder than I first expected. It turned out that I had to settle a few smaller questions in pursuit of the larger one. How much use does a certain move get compared to other moves on a character's kit? Is it used for comboing, killing, is it best used in neutral, advantage state, disadvantage state, and which of these traits does the character value most highly? Is it more important that a move contributes to the existing strengths of a character in a major way, or shores up what would otherwise be a sizable weakness? Does it have advanced techniques or use cases attached to it beyond what first meets the eye? And if so, are they impractical gimmicks, or do they totally redefine how the move needs to be thought about? Does a move perform well because of its inherent strengths, or because some other move enables it? Or maybe it's a property of the character, and if any of these are the case, should this kind of synergy be considered a point in favor of the move, or against it? The selection for any character took all of these and more into account, and while many of them can't be applied universally for every case, I did settle on a few standards. Everything is being judged in the context of a character's kit, not in a vacuum. I'm also somewhat de-emphasizing just pure usage amount, because otherwise essentially every character would have some kind of aerial chosen by default. The nature of platform fighters in general, and Ultimate's design philosophy in particular, heavily favors using them. For the most part, this also applies to recovery moves. Sure, most characters need to use them a lot, and would be gutted if they had a bad one, but that's not really in the spirit of what we're looking for. It's a bit of a messy question, but I did my best to keep things somewhat consistent and make my thought process clear for every character. Also, heads up, this idea straight up comes from P. Jiggles, who covered every character's worst move several years ago in a video series on his channel, which I did a reaction and update video for over on my second channel, Mock Rock Talk. I've gotten a lot of comments since then asking me to cover this idea, which I was hesitant about because I didn't want to tread on his toes, but I checked in, and he's not planning to make a video like this anytime soon, and if he ever does, it'll actually be formatted pretty differently since he sourced his list from various character discords. I'm not going to be doing that. This list is entirely my own, so it looks like I'm in the clear. Oh hey! Look what showed up in my sub box today. <sighs> yeah, so while I was deep into editing this way past the point of no return, another channel called Vars3 uploaded the first part of a video covering the same concept. I've actually talked to Vars before, and I messaged him when I saw this. He runs a great Smash channel that he said takes some inspiration from mine, so I guess it was only a matter of time before we ran into some inconveniently timed parallel thinking. His video is actually very different, both in terms of format and content, so if you like this topic, please go check his out too. He makes great stuff that you honestly likely will enjoy if you're a Mock Rock fan. As for for my video, I always do my research ahead of time, but of course that's no guarantee that you're going to agree with every pick, so feel free to make your case in the comments. On the one hand, I obviously don't play every character equally, but on the other hand, I'm also not going to try and convince you that Kirby's down air is worse than his hammer. Hey, Kirby Discord, what are you taking, and how do I get in on it? Let's go. Getting hit by any of the moves in this video is scary. You know what's scarier? Cyber security threats! Luckily, you can do something about that thanks to today's sponsor, NordVPN, who are offering an exclusive deal for Mock Rock viewers who check out my link. Their threat protection feature is a fantastic way to shield yourself from trackers and malware while you're surfing the web. And their dark web monitor gives you an automatic notification if any of your credentials get leaked online. Are your passwords too simple and... Okay, you know that, and you know you should be doing better, but secure ones are just too hard to keep track of. Easy, just let their NordPass password manager do it for you. NordVPN is more than just a VPN. But of course it's also a VPN, which means that you can use its privacy-oriented, non-tracking app or browser extension to enhance your online experience in all sorts of ways. My favorite is for streaming services. I'm Canadian, so if I were to, say, go to Netflix and type in one of my favorite sci-fi movies... Oh. Well, that sucks. Just enable NordVPN and connect to a UK server, though, and hey, no more region locking. You can try it for yourself with a risk-free, 30-day money-back guarantee, plus a free month, by using my link in the description and pinned comment of this video. A big thanks to NordVPN for supporting the channel. Mario may have a lot of strong fundamental-based tools, but in Ultimate, he's still most famous for his cheesy ladder combos, which are enabled almost entirely thanks to Up Air. With a great hitbox that comes out in a measly four frames and has absolutely minuscule landing lag, this move can also be used in a myriad of other ways, both on the way up and down as well. It's one of the safest attacks in the entire game to land on shield, so the risk-reward is very much in your favor, and if you get past that shield, it sets up perfectly into a ladder combo or just directly into his monstrous spiking forward air thanks to popping opponents almost straight up. And at earlier percents, you don't even need to bother trying to set up for the landing version. It's so stupidly quick that rising up air still initiates the spiking combo. 
What a ridiculous move to give to what was formerly a beginner-friendly tutorial-style character. Donkey Kong's back arrow was a strong candidate for this video, an extremely versatile move on a character whose kit can sometimes feel clunky, but I ultimately need to go with his unique forward throw. Ultimate has very few true grapplers, and the reward that DK gets off this cargo throw very much earns him the title. At early percents, he gets simple and highly effective damage tracking. After winning one or two exchanges, he's already set to start hunting for platform-assisted kill confirms, which have a fairly generous positional component and aren't too difficult to perform technically. And then later on, things get even simpler as DK simply walks off stage and chucks his opponent into the void. Forward throw has been one of Donkey Kong's defining moves in Smash for a very long time, and it's in great form here. I think the first two entries are likely going to be pretty popular, but the choice for Link is the first one that feels a bit more contentious, and I'm going with his down special, the Remote Bomb. The mountain of ways that Link has to interact with the bomb gives it absurd utility. It does everything from ledge trapping, which can be accomplished in many different ways, to recovery duties through self-detonation, for which there are also multiple techniques that he can utilize, to much fancier stuff. And this fancy stuff is a good chunk of the reason that I'm giving the nod to it. Link is in kind of a funny spot because his statistically best player, T from Japan, usually stuck to a very simple game plan while he was really active, based around staple tools like neutral air, forward air, and boomerang. Fancy bomb stuff is still often seen as kind of a cute gimmick chucked on top of that right now, and it may stay that way forever, but it's also hard to overstate just how much influence a single prominent player can have on the perception of a character's metagame. Fundamentals are always going to come first, and if a player ever comes through that consistently puts Link in the international spotlight, they will absolutely have strong fundamentals, but I also think they'll likely need a firm grasp of the most broken stuff that Link is capable of to let him keep pace with Ultimate's faster and more powerful characters. I also don't think this is unrealistic. Link isn't a popular character right now, and this is partially because of just how much effort he requires compared to simpler and probably still stronger characters, but I've been following Smash for long enough to see this kind of scenario play out many times, and it would only take one or two major tournament runs for people to once again start talking about how stupid that bomb is. The technical side of difficult characters like this usually does get solved eventually. The bigger question is how viable the setups that lead into the finger-breaking stuff are if you're still trying to play a fundamentally sound game, and for Link, you know, they're actually not bad. If I wasn't trying to hedge for the future, I'd probably say his best move is Neutral Air, but Bomb is already one of Link's better moves, certainly good enough to be in the discussion regardless, and hey, I'm an optimist. For both Samus and Dark Samus, their best move is definitely Charge Shot. This thing has been around in every Smash game and been good in every Smash game, but in Ultimate, it's better than ever. The amount of use cases here are just ridiculous. It grants free pressure in the neutral game thanks to being cancelable at any time, making the Samus a total nightmare to face at mid-range. It can be B-reversed and gets to keep its charge in the air, a new feature in Ultimate, allowing it to be used for tricky mix-ups both offensively and defensively. It's one of the best ledge trapping tools in the entire game, especially when you've also got morph ball bombs to force your opponent to get off the ledge with a specific timing. If you miss, who cares? It's a projectile, you're probably safe anyways, but if it lands, the reward is incredible. At minimum, a hefty amount of damage, we're talking 30 plus on a full charge, and at best a kill at very generous percents. You want combos? Sure. Why not? Combo into an aerial. Combo into their long-range tether grab, which itself starts longer combos or leads into multiple kill throws later on. Combo into dash attack for a simple but effective confirm. At this point, after this many improvements, I'm willing to call it one of the best moves in Ultimate, period. You can make a solid case for calling basically any of Yoshi's aerials his best move. They're all good, and they get a further boost from his incredible air speed, but personally, I'm going with back air. While Yoshi has an excellent spacing forward air that a lot of characters would kill for, the very best Yoshi players are often seen approaching with reverse aerial rush back airs instead, thanks to his increased speed, much more persistent hitbox, and potentially higher reward. Yoshi's back air works as a combo starter in the traditional sense earlier on, but it can also create combos at any percent by interrupting its multi-hits. This is some really nice multi-hit work as well, comboing falling back air into forward smash is kind of silly. These traits all come together to give Yoshi an excellent tool, and one very much worth giving up the traditional killing role that back airs usually fill. Oh. Sorry. Never mind, back air is also a great kill move on top of everything else. And it can do so off the top or the side, and again, Yoshi's absurd air physics make it really easy to chase opponents up high. Now, you can also chase opponents above you with up air, and this fight was neck and neck between them, about as close as you're ever going to see in this video. Back air is better in the neutral and for raw kills, but Yoshi's up air is a vital combo tool when used in tandem with his double jump, enabling some very long chains while also working as a much better pure kill move compared to something like Mario's. I'm giving a slight nod to back air because, as you start ascending the ranks of Yoshi players, one thing that becomes really apparent is that they start using back air a lot more, and a lot more effectively. At its full potential, it does pretty much everything, whereas up air is slightly more specific, albeit what it specifically does is phenomenally good.
My choice for Kirby will go to Forward Air, which feels like a bit of a funny choice. This is why I said the question was harder than I expected. When people discuss good Kirby moves, the discussion usually turns to up tilt, which is definitely one of the better up tilts in the game, whereas I think there are plenty of better Forward Airs than Kirby's in a vacuum. In the context of Kirby's particular kit, though, he's a close range brawler character whose game plan heavily revolves around getting in his opponent's face and throwing out quick moves, with Forward Air and Down Tilt doing a lot of the heavy lifting. Down Tilt would be a good candidate as well. It's done out of his crouch, which allows Kirby to avoid a lot of powerful stuff, and it can potentially lead into big combos. I say potentially, though, because Down Tilt's ability to trip opponents is random. He doesn't get it every time. Because of this inconsistency, even in a lot of cases where Kirby players do land the Down Tilt trip, you'll still see them combo it into Forward Air. Because Down Tilt into Forward Air is a decent sequence on trip, no trip, or even on shield, which takes a lot of pressure off the Kirby player since they don't need to react to the situation quite as stringently. Outside of its use with Down Tilt, Forward Air is also one of Kirby's few lingering attacks and also one of his longest ranged giving it an indispensable array of use cases from tossing it out in the neutral, to pressuring the ledge, to using it both as a combo ender at early percents, and a combo starter at any percent as well. The move is actually reminiscent of Yoshi's back air in a lot of ways, including its ability to drag down into kill confirms. It's also more natural to use because it faces forwards, and while Kirby doesn't have Yoshi's air mobility, it's still a good enough hitbox to make retreating forward air a fantastic spacing tool, something that Kirby is in so much short supply of. Now, his up tilt has some spacing capabilities as well, and is an overall very strong button with some situationally busted use thanks to being loopable with downer under certain scenarios, but in a broader sense, Kirby doesn't really have the toolkit to take advantage of his own up tilt's potential. His jump is so stubby that vertical combos start getting cut off pretty early, and the up air that he eventually has to end on isn't strong enough to accomplish too much. Up tilt to up air will kill some characters sometimes if they're on a platform specifically, but otherwise it just starts a juggle, and Kirby's poor mobility and small hitboxes don't make him a natural juggler. If forward air connects, on the other hand, it always pushes opponents off stage for edge guarding and ledge trapping, areas that Kirby performs better in also partially thanks to forward air, and it provides him with more concrete rewards at a broader range of percents. Fox comes in with his simple but exceptionally effective up smash. At frame 7, this is one of the fastest up smashes in the game period, and when you combine that with Fox's extreme mobility, he's excellent at confirming into it. In fact, that's usually the main thing he's trying to do given how powerful it is as well. His combination of speed and a good hitbox also makes it a very solid out of shield option, and even lets him end a lot of combos with a good chunk of extra damage over what he'd normally get. It's obviously still mostly a pure kill move though, and you won't see a ton of those today, there's definitely going to be a slant towards moves with more use cases over all, but up smash is so incredibly important to Fox's game plan. I did consider an aerial, particularly neutral air because it's how Fox starts a lot of his confirms into up smash and is also an overall great move that works at any stage of the game before that as a combo and pressure tool. That being said, neutral air isn't the only thing he uses that can lead into up smash confirms, even if it's probably the most common one he goes for, and its pressure exists in conjunction with other moves like up tilt, jab, and dash attack, a move that I was also considering, so it's a bit difficult to single it out specifically. Back air also becomes one of his most important moves later on in an opponent's stock, and up air is another of his most important moves that creates the infamous Fox Vortex, where he puts you up into the air and simply does not let you land again. I'll choose the attack that Fox regularly can and does base his entire strategy around. It's telling that the best Fox player in the world, Light, is also the best at creating up smash opportunities. Pikachu has been in at least talks for the best character in Ultimate since launch day, so it's not a surprise that he has a lot of good moves, but I think Thunder Jolt, his projectile neutral special, is what really puts him over the top. Pikachu has an excellent neutral game, and a ridiculously big part of this comes from just how incredible an approaching tool Thunder Jolt is, forcing opponents to dance around the massive amount of space it controls and leading into combos if it does connect. Without Thunder Jolt, Pikachu would still be a quick character, but a very stubby one, who would likely have a lot of difficulty actually getting in range to take full advantage of his close quarters tools. With Thunder Jolt, this concern still exists and is certainly one of Pikachu's weaknesses, but it is mitigated heavily. My decision was made even easier by the fact that Pikachu has a lot of busted close range tools that frequently get employed in multiples for any given combo, putting them in heavy competition with each other, whereas there's really nothing else on his kit that even vaguely replicates what Thunder Jolt can do. If Donkey Kong is one of Smash's few true grapplers, then Luigi weirdly needs to be in there as well. Where I gave praise to the Big Ape's forward throw, Luigi likewise gets down throw for his best move choice. Did you get grabbed at zero? Then there's a very realistic chance that you're simply losing that stock. He's one of only a few characters in Ultimate with a true zero to death combo. Even if you manage to get out of that first grab alive, taking less than 50 or 60% would be considered a very good day, which is right around the time his next grab starts leading into aerial super jump punch. And after that, 
but you get Luigi Cyclone or Back Air, just in case you ever had any kind of misconception about being able to escape. This all gets aided enormously by the unusually safe tether grab that Luigi was given for Ultimate, far safer than usual, as well as the removal of his previously very slippery physics, which moved him from fishing for down throw to FISHING FOR DOWN THROW. Ness has a lot of good buttons. He's notorious for a playstyle that looks like he's fighting ghosts, but only one button works as a mobility option, an anti-projectile tool, and an extremely large and useful hitbox. This hitbox was a new addition for Ultimate, and it turned out to be a total game changer. This isn't just any ordinary hitbox, it comes out in pulses, and those pulses combo into each other, meaning that with proper technique, you can carry your opponent all the way across the stage in a truly inescapable sequence. These are still a bit on the gimmick side of things at the moment, similar to what I brought up for Link's Bomb, but they're not nearly as handbreaking, have even simpler setups to lead into them, and similarly have the potential to do a ton for Ness in the meta if ever truly mastered. This involves a lot more than just the one infinite, by the way. Advanced PSI magnet stuff is… yeah, a bit more of a rabbit hole than I can fully go down for this video. Even without the gimmick stuff, there are still a ton of great setups which take considerably less effort, and the mobility options it provides alone, from air stalling to B reversals to cancelling Ness's unique double jump, are absolutely indispensable. And hey, who knows, once in a blue moon you might even use it for its original purpose and absorb a projectile. Okay, fine, in some matchups that's actually a pretty big deal. Captain Falcon is most famous for high speed and exciting combos, and in Ultimate those combos are mostly facilitated through two moves, neutral air and up air. I'm choosing neutral air for the title because it's got a wider range of use cases than up air, with the final hit going from a strong combo starter and ender early on to a good kill move later, and the first hit also working as a potent combo starter in its own right. It's a shame that the move has some consistency issues in the air, a common theme among multi-hit aerials, but it's not the worst in the game by any stretch. His single hit up air obviously doesn't have this problem and as mentioned was a strong contender, a lot of what he looks for leads into extended up-air combos and juggles, but I'm still going with the trickier and overall more versatile kick. Jigglypuff was… actually really hard to decide on. She's the most aerial-focused character in a very air-heavy game, so the choice was definitely between one of her aerials or her honorary aerial pound, but she uses several of them so much that trying to single one out was fairly tricky. At the end of the day though, I think I'm opting for down air. On most characters' movesets this drill kick would be solid, if unremarkable. But Puff's phenomenal air movement allows it to be used as a legitimate approach option or combo extender, and connecting it can lead into or continue really nasty combos, including the ability to loop Dan Air into itself multiple times before going for something else, usually another aerial. This makes Dan Air an enabler for her other moves, and using it as a drag down into rest can be a legitimate, albeit somewhat unreliable, Hail Mary option to steal a stock away. It's honestly really close here though, Jigglypuff's whole thing is floating around and then throwing something out in the air, and I'd completely accept an argument in favor of neutral air or forward air for their better general usage, or Pound's mobility and strong combo potential of its own, but Dan Air opens up a lot of the more degenerate things that Jigglypuff can perform, short of extremely committal options like risky rest combos. Even though it does those as well, in several different ways. A character this fragile needs a bit of degeneracy in their kit, preferably without putting them at too much risk to use it, and Danner fits the bill. Peach and Daisy both get something a bit different, and I'm saying their best move is the floating ability that Peach takes from Super Mario Bros. 2, and which Daisy takes from Echo Fighters being a bitter disappointment. I know that not everybody watching this is going to consider float to be a move, but listen, she already has a double jump, so this is something separate. We're past the point where all special moves need to be mapped to a traditional input, and if this was her up special, nobody would bat an eye. I say it counts, and I say that if you agree it counts, there's no competition. Oh, and just to head off some comments I know I'm gonna get from repeat viewers, I know I didn't put this in the non-traditional moves category of the best of every smash move video I did a while ago, and yes, if I were to do that video nowadays, I would include it. I've changed my mind. Float would already be very good, even if it was limited to a simple mobile mobility option, and Peach and Daisy certainly do put that aspect of it to plenty of use, but the fact that it can be halted instantly and then cancelled into an aerial makes it one of the most incredibly powerful tools that any Smash character has ever had access to. Floatless what would otherwise be a relatively humble moveset outputs some of the highest damage among the entire roster, especially combined with the low knockback, high hit stun turnups that they can pull, and this gets enhanced even further by the fact that while aerials done out of a short hop suffer a universal damage penalty in Ultimate, this penalty gets by 
passed if an aerial is done out of a float instead, no matter how close to the ground it was. Yeah, you know, that actually seems like kind of an oversight, but hey, patches are over, they're safe now. On top of giving Peach and Daisy incredible damage potential, float cancelling also gives them an unprecedented neutral tool, thanks to being able to perform uniquely tricky movement mix-ups and fire off any aerial at a moment's notice. This comes with a pretty heavy execution barrier to consistently pull off the powerful stuff and makes Peach and Daisy some of the more technical characters in the game, but it's a skill undeniably worth mastering. Bowser has a lot of really scary moves at his disposal, ranging from a near-unpunishable, persistent projectile to one of the biggest and nastiest aerials in the game, but I think the one that really puts him over the top is Flying Slam, his side special. With a measly six frames of wind-up, this would be a blistering fast command grab by any standard. It's actually as fast as normal grabs are allowed to be in Ultimate, but on a heavyweight? It's unheard of. This gives Bowser a completely unreactable attack that connects whether his opponent is on the ground, they're in the air trying to land or launch an attack of their own, or they're stuck up on a platform, and as a command grab, it doesn't care whether someone is shielding or not. This speed also allows for some true confirms into it, not that going for Flying Slam Raw is particularly a problem, and on connection it does an easy 20 plus damage and gives Bowser fantastic positioning. That is, before it starts simply killing opponents, even earlier when he's got a platform to land on. And just as a bonus, he can also dive off stage for a kamikaze stock. These Bowser sides, as they're known, aren't the most reliable things in the world since opponents also get some say in how Bowser carries them through the air. Bowser dies first, and some characters can even survive the attempt, but you do still see them pop up in high level play from time to time. Most of Bowser's moveset is scary, but it's scary in a relatively predictable way. When you throw Flying Slam into the mix, though, it makes trying to call out Bowser's next move immensely more difficult. That's the power of command grabs, particularly unreactable ones, and for my money, this may well be the best command grab in the game, especially when paired with Bowser's surprising speed and ability to scare opponents into shield. Two special moves were pitted head to head for the Ice Climbers, Squall Hammer, their side special, and Blizzard, their down special. Both moves are staples of the Icy's fancy decent combos that they're best known for in Ultimate. Extended multi-hit attacks are the perfect tool to lock an opponent in place with one climber so that the other one can set up for the next step of the combo. Both of them are also great in the neutral, with Squall Hammer being one of the best and safest burst movement options in the game which can potentially lead to huge damage if it connects, and Blizzard being able to create desynced walls of ice that are rough for a lot of characters to get around. Both moves can also be used to create true unblockable setups, a rare trait for any attack to have an ultimate by using one climber to lock an opponent into shield while the other one is still free to act. They're both extremely good in a lot of different scenarios, but in a very general sense I'd say that Squall Hammer is the more powerful and spammable neutral tool, and Blizzard is responsible for more of the advanced setups that you're going to see show up in highlight reels. At the end of the day, neutral is always going to be king, even for a character this setup heavy, so I'd give a small edge to Squall Hammer. It's also a much better tool for escaping disadvantage than Blizzard is, and it helps just a bit that it's still a pretty decent move even with the solo ice climber. Sheik's best move was a difficult call between two very different options, her historically consistent forward air and the extremely versatile Bouncing Fish. I think Bouncing Fish would be the less replaceable move, though. It's a tremendously important part of Sheik's combo game, it's the reason her recovery and disadvantage states are so fantastic, and it's probably also her most important kill move. She can already famously struggle to finish stocks off in Ultimate, but this would be much, MUCH worse if she didn't have her series of staple confirms into Bouncing Fish, and it's also regularly used to kill opponents in disadvantage state, which is a situation that she does excel at setting up. Now, part of the reason she's so good at winning neutral to set this up is admittedly because of how safe and efficient forward air is. I said it was a tough choice, but Bouncing Fish just provides her with so many different benefits. Sheik may have been a tough call, but get her out of the ninja disguise and things become a lot easier. Zelda's best move is Phantom, and it's not close. Zelda has struggled heavily in the neutral game throughout the Smash series as that was always intended to be Sheik's role, and Smash 4's decision to take her transformation away, replaced with nothing but yet another mediocre projectile, without making any other substantial changes to her game plan left her feeling totally stranded. In Ultimate, on the other hand, that formerly mediocre projectile now offers some of the best space control in the business, allowing Zelda to set it up ahead of time and then move freely before it comes out. Pair that with an absolutely enormous hitbox at full charge, large enough to both work as an anti-air and cover the ledge at the same time, and Zelda can now generate a degree of pressure she's never even come close to matching before. The delayed nature of the Phantom also lets it be used in all sorts of combo applications, and it can even be used defensively to make Zelda's own return to the stage much easier by providing pressure while she's in the middle of the recovery process. The one substantial downgrade that Phantom received between Smash 4 and Ultimate is that it now spawns behind her, leaving Zelda vulnerable, but even this can be solved with an advanced technique called Phantom Displacement. Now, Phantom's already great, and this isn't essential tech by any means, but hey, can't complain about taking a great move and making it even greater. 
In another display of the importance of controlling space, Dr. Mario's best move in my eyes is the slow-moving Mega Vitamin Pill. As one of the game's slower and stubbier characters, this move is a godsend which vastly improves Doc's approach game similar to Pikachu's Thunder Jolt, but on top of that, the reward for connecting it is also considerably higher and more reliable. Pills trap opponents in quite a bit of hit stun, which means that as long as Doc approaches alongside the pill, he can pretty much just combo it into imagination. Pick an aerial, pick a special, they're all gonna work, and they're all gonna work well, because for all the things Doc may be lacking, power is not one of them. This power can be found in a lot of solid close range moves, including his excellent back air, which I did consider, but it's another case of a character who massively benefits from being able to force his way in so he can actually use it. Pichu basically has two types of attacks. Ones that do stupid damage and start killing immediately, and ones that combo until the end of time. I think that the combo tools tend to be more important overall, and out of all of them, up air probably puts the most work in. This tail flip is pretty reminiscent of Mario's up air, even coming out on the same frame, although it functionally tends to be slightly slower on average as it starts behind Pichu. That's still plenty quick though, and unlike Mario's kick, Pichu's up air essentially never scales into a kill move, which is not a downside. The thing has so insanely low knockback growth that it basically never stops comboing, confirming into literally any aerial in Pichu's arsenal even when the opponent is brushing up on triple digit damage, and then when that stops connecting, it starts confirming into aerial thunder as well, a great way to reliably take stocks later on. Or even not so later on, Pichu can actually score some pretty cheesy kills with falling up air into thunder, between its high fall speed, up air's trajectory, and thunder's high hitbox, all the stars just align perfectly. As a bonus, because up air doesn't use electricity, it's one of the moves that Pichu can toss out as much as it wants without taking any self damage. The same can't be said for Thunder Jolt, for the record, which is part of the reason that Pichu doesn't get the same move choice as his evolved form, although Pikachu's Thunder Jolt also covers noticeably more space than Pichu's does. Falco's subpar mobility is balanced out with a combo-oriented moveset that's strong across the board, but it should come as no surprise that his notorious up tilt gets the spotlight here. Up tilt is huge, long-lasting, spammable thanks to its low end leg, and leg which also makes it bizarrely safe on shield for this category of move, and if it connects? That's when the fun starts. Up tilt reliably leads into every single one of Falco's aerials, and several of them see very consistent use to carry his opponent all over the stage. Up tilt to back air is an absolutely vital kill confirm that Falco leans on heavily. Up tilt to up air creates fantastic juggling combos which are a total staple of Falco's punish game, sometimes also allowing for a vertical kill confirm a bit later into the stock or if they're on a platform. And up tilt into forward air works as a drag down option to create different types of platform extensions, and you'd better believe that Falco's good at extending off a platform. Up tilt into neutral air or down air are a bit more niche, but they work and you do see them. Falco's got no shortage of options out of up tilt, and different players often opt for different combo routes in the same scenario. It's an attack that synergizes perfectly both with the rest of his moveset and his uniquely high double jump, so despite all the other very solid buttons available to him, this one was a pretty easy choice to make. Marth, and especially Lucina, are Ultimate's no-nonsense sword fighters, and Forward Air is the ultimate no-nonsense sword move. It's huge, it's disjointed, it covers above and below them, it's quick, and it's safe. Apart from not having the world's absolute greatest kill power, it does pretty much everything you'd ever ask a sword aerial to do. Now, if I had to choose which one is the better of the two, I think I'd give the edge to Marth with his tipper sweet spot. It's one of his easier tippers to land in my experience, and pulling this off offers more damage, makes it safer alongside doing a bit more shield damage, and kills earlier than Lucina's more straightforward arc. That still doesn't make Forward Air one of either of their best kill moves outside of edgeguarding scenarios, but in that context, even Marth's sour spots often do the job just fine. You're really just looking to knock an opponent away with anything you can. That sour spot is sometimes an advantage anyways, as it lets Marth get some simple combos for a bit longer than Lucina can thanks to its lower knockback. The extremes versus consistency tug of war is pretty close on this particular move to be honest though. Marth and Lucina are both characters that just want to point their sword at the other guy, and that's usually going to mean in front of them. The closest contender was probably Neutral Air, but that's a move that has some pretty severe consistency problems. Young Link appeared in a single Smash game before disappearing for almost two decades, and when he returned, his fire arrows turned out to be one of the most buffed moves in the series' history. This projectile is lightning fast, travels amazingly far even if not charged, and is another of these combo into imagination tools that Young Link takes full advantage of. Its speed and range also allow it to be used as a combo follow-up off of other projectiles, a relatively distinct part of Young Link's gameplay which has become a major part of his optimization over the years. If there's one big knock against the arrows is that they actually travel so fast that the most impressive 
aggressive true combos don't really start emerging until the opponent is at pretty high percent, because there needs to be a good amount of hits done to give Link time to follow up behind them. On the other hand though, once those combos do come online, they're pretty much just going to stay online. And the speed of the fire arrows makes them incredibly annoying to deal with at all stages of the game, which is just how young Link mains like it. I should give a shout out to Neutral Air as well. It's a fantastic example of the ubiquitous flying sidekick that both combos early on and then kills later, but it's the kind of stubby move on a stubby character that can really benefit from gap closers, and they're so quick that the constant threat of them changes how opponents have to play at mid-range, making it easier for young Link to connect his most rewarding close quarters tools. Ganondorf may be the embodiment of the Triforce of Power, but it's actually Neutral Air, one of his moves that's less based around pure power that he's most associated with in Ultimate. Now, make no mistake, the move is still plenty strong, dealing impressive damage and killing reasonably early, but it's overall a bit on the modest side for a character that routinely looks for kills early in the double digits. The real strengths of Neutral Air come from its utility, being one of Ganondorf's fastest, longest ranged, and longest lasting moves with impressively low end lag, meaning that spamming Neutral Air is often the name of the game for Ganondorf's neutral and disadvantage state and advantage state. The combination of range, power, and longevity team up to create an exceptionally potent edge guarding tool that can cover a lot of options at the same time. It can even straight up beat a lot of recoveries outright, thanks to being way more disjointed than it looks. It's a shame that the two hits can have some reliability issues, but at least even the first hit also comes with a bit of combo potential when done landing, kind of a diet version of its Captain Falcon inspiration. Mewtwo has a lot of powerful long-ranged moves between his tail and his psychic abilities, but his longest-ranged move is also what I'd call his best. Shadow Ball is in many ways reminiscent of Samus's charge shot from earlier, but this one travels slower and follows a unique bobbing trajectory, and these traits offer it some distinct advantages. Mewtwo can easily approach from behind even an uncharged Shadow Ball, helped greatly by his fast ground speed and the move's surprisingly low end lag, a buff that it was given in a balance patch. It forces opponents to dance like crazy to avoid it, but still, in all honesty, isn't that hard to connect, and and while the hit stun it creates isn't especially impressive, it still leads into a wide array of combos depending on an opponent's percentage, the charge level of the ball, and the position that Mewtwo was in when he threw it. With proper spacing, its bobbing trajectory can also hit opponents hanging on the ledge, which takes a style of move which was already fantastic for ledge trapping to even greater heights. And while we're talking about height, Mewtwo's double jump works similarly to Ness's, and like Ness, he can cancel his momentum with special moves, giving Shadow Ball some additional unique functionality. I'm not personally a huge fan of the move losing some of its most interesting aspects over the years, first the charge hitbox and then its exaggerated mobility options, but this may still be the best iteration it's seen in any Smash game and is definitely one of Ultimate's better projectiles. Another Fire Emblem duo, Roy and Krom are some of the more distinct clones in the game, operating on a sweet spot versus consistency principle that separates their playstyles even more than Martha and Lucina, while coming with a few additional changes on top of that. Krom is the more consistent and range-oriented of the two, which makes the incredible frame data of his up air in particular a major asset. It's so fast, and Krom's air movement is so abrupt that even connecting a rising up air can take opponents for an extended ride, which, of course, just means that falling up airs become even more insane. In addition to getting some of the highest reward off an up air of any character, Krom also has one of the easiest times fishing for it. Between his excellent overall mobility and the sword arc coming with a hitbox that lives up to the high bar that its speed sets, Krom can weave in and out with up air, up and down with it, without too much concern, all in pursuit of that consistently fantastic payoff for connecting just one. All of this of course also applies to Roy, minus the hitbox comments, as his up air comes with the customary hilt sweet spot found on most of his moves. This makes Roy's up air a bit better of a kill move than Krom's, but still not a great one, and it means that while his early vertical combos can do additional damage, they're also going to start falling off a lot earlier because of the sweet spot's higher knockback. Now, the tipper sour spot on Roy's sword isn't bad by any stretch, it actually means that he gets to combo for a lot longer than Krom does, but in practice I'd say they're slightly finicky to line up sometimes and don't quite match up to Krom's ability to just chuck it out there. In that case, I'd call Roy's best move his unusual jab, a single hit uppercut that starts comboing immediately, and then by about 50% or so he's already able to start hunting for kill confirms out of it. Staple combos that both characters share, like jab to back air, probably their most important overall kill confirm, or jab to forward smash a bit earlier on, also tend to kill quite a bit earlier with Roy's sweet spot in the mix. That sweet spot starts comboing from literally 0% as well, whereas Krom's takes a little while to start coming online. The crazy thing is that even with all these points in Roy's favor, Krom's still might have the better jab, because once it does start true comboing, its threat range is substantially better. Roy doesn't exactly struggle to get into an opponent's face 
and connect the sweet spot, but not having to do this is still undeniably a major benefit. Krom may often be relying on an opponent not DIing properly to convert off the tip of his jab, but even against good players, this does happen regularly. Human reaction time is only so fast. That all said, I think the better jab is much more contestable compared to their up airs, and regardless of what side you land on, looking at the entirety of each character's kit, Roy seems much better set up to abuse jab as much as possible, even if the sweet spot does take a bit more work to connect. It was very close this time around, though, on both moves for both characters. You're watching what I think is the fifth draft of this segment? I said earlier in the video that I was going to avoid picking too many up specials, but going with anything besides fire for Mr. Game & Watch just feels disingenuous. This upwards launch comes out on frame 3, making it literally as fast as any outer shield option is allowed to be in ultimate, and even for the very small handful of moves that it's not capable of punishing, you're still probably okay thanks to its high trajectory and the lack of freefall it puts you in afterwards. Mr. Game & Watch is somewhat vulnerable if he whiffs against them or other moves that are spaced very well. I've talked about that before and you do see this pop up more and more often as ultimate's meta marches on. On, but their risk reward is still very much in his favor overall. Not every character can punish fire, a lot of players still don't try it, the ones that do need to be very quick, plus you can just head off even the safest move ahead of time anyways, there are invincibility frames on this thing. He needs it. The lack of freefall that I just mentioned also makes it an exceptionally multifaceted recovery tool, which pairs well with his forward and Danner to help mix up his descent even further, and allows the move to be integrated anywhere into a combo. Whether we're talking about using it as a combo starter, an ender, something that works for a very long time because of how high fire goes, or even harnessing all of its properties together to use it as a link in the middle of a longer combo. I'd consider it to easily be the best up special in the game, and one of Ultimate's best moves, period. A lot of characters get shut down by this almost single-handedly. Modern Meta Knight is a combo character, which means that we're back in the realm of sword up airs, although this one isn't a utility machine in the same manner as Roy and Krom. Meta Knight's quick slash does one thing, and it does it well. Team up with his multi-jumps to carry opponents either beside or above the stage, and then close things out with one of his several potent finishers. It's a relatively simple game plan, but not an easy one. It actually takes a lot of matchup knowledge and situational awareness to execute consistently, and sometimes requires mixing in down airs or extending off of a platform to make sure that the combo stays rolling. The consistency of these combos does get helped a bit by the fact that up air doesn't put opponents into a tumbling animation at early percents, which they have to be in to use proper DI, but they're still able to do smash DI by wiggling the stick in the direction they want to go to make things as hard for Meta Knight as they can. Regardless of the specifics though, his game plan is always going to involve abusing up air as much as possible, and he's also got a handful of moves like down throw and dash attack to help start things off, although going for it raw is a totally viable option between its speed and his air control. If you've watched this channel for a while, you may know that A, I main Dark Pit, and B, that I love to complain about this character's stupid, weirdly programmed neutral air. Its hitboxes are way smaller than the animation for no reason. Its drag down combos are way worse than what other characters get for no reason. Characters constantly pop out of it for no reason. Oh, come on, what the f- All right. Look, the move's got problems, but even so, it's still incredibly important to both Pit's game plans, and I'm still calling it their best move. A frame 4 lingering disjoint, however small it may be, which can start combos at low percents even if done rising, is an incredibly powerful tool. And the harsh horizontal angle that it sends at makes it a genuinely nasty edgeguarding move when it does connect cleanly. That angle also makes it a good option for starting tech chases and putting opponents onto platforms, situations that the Pits are pretty good at covering, partially also thanks to the persistence of neutral air. This persistence comes in clutch in the new Neutral is a great spot dodge buster too. It's fast enough out of shield to catch a lot of stuff anyways, but for moves that it can't, aerial on shield into spot dodge is a common sequence in ultimate that neutral air largely takes away. The pits have a lot of ways to combo into neutral air as well, and while its role as a traditional combo starter in its own right doesn't stick around for all that long, there are some true drag down setups to go for, although again, they really do tend to be a lot more finicky and unreliable than the move's peers. Uh, if the pit's neutral air wasn't programmed by an intern and had hitboxes that lined up with the animation, connected properly, and had reasonable hits done on the multi-hits, it would be great, and likely a top 5 neutral air in the game at a minimum. As is, it's still the pit's best move, and at the very least Nair rants are going to be helping me pad out video runtimes for however long it takes us to get Smash 6. I swear to god, if Smash 6 comes around and it still looks like this, I'm just chucking these characters in the dumpster. Like, I'm not even unlocking them.
Zero Suit Samus has a bit of a weird, ambiguous playstyle, but one thing she's unambiguously great at is running away, and Flip Jump is the main factor behind that. This third long-ranged arcing jump, which she gets on top of her two already great standard jumps, doesn't put Samus into freefall and has invincibility on startup for some reason, making it arguably the single best move in the entire game for getting out of disadvantage state. That's not even including the fact that trying to challenge it, and guessing wrong, can get you buried in the ground. We're just talking about its defensive use here though. The Flip Jump also comes with an optional kick that hits very hard, especially on its sweet spot, delivering a powerful spike that enables kill confirms even at extremely early percents. It's pretty easy to just land it raw, too, thanks to being attached to such a potent mobility tool. And while getting the sweet spot can feel a bit specific, the Sour Spot reward is still solid, and you can't really complain that much about such a fantastic movement option coming with an upside. The jump alone would still probably be enough to call it the best tool in Zero Suit Samus's arsenal. Getting stuck in disadvantage state is a death knell for many characters and it's an entire phase of the game that she gets to borderline skip entirely. On offense, meanwhile, the mobility aspect allows her to go as deep as she wants for an edge guard, generally still making it back first and retaining stage control even if she whiffs or decides to pull the plug on the idea. Wario has some scary moves, but let's be real. It's waft that makes him terrifying. It's got a long charge time, sure, even if chomping on something or someone does bring it down by a second, but the wait is well worth it. At full charge, waft is a massive, armored hitbox that kills famously early, already a great feature, but what puts it over the top is that it can be comboed into by many of Wario's best moves. His long-lasting, weirdly disjointed up tilt? Yep, that'll do it. What about Falling Up Air, one of the safest moves on shield in the entire game, and my runner-up choice for the title? That works too. His bike? Yeah, sure, why not? Situational, but it does the job just fine. Neutral air? Uh-huh. And of course, we don't just have to talk about these 1-2 sequences. One of Wario's big strengths in Ultimate is the way his aerials chain into each other, potentially letting him drag opponents across the entire stage, and if he has Waft charged, you can bet that's how his combo is wrapping up. Waft is so strong and so reliable that against a Wario who's good with the confirms, an opponent is playing more of a 2.5 stock or 2.25 stock game to Wario's 3. Two and an eighth, maybe. Or potentially even less because the waft doesn't need to be at full charge to be potent. Games decided by multiple wafts aren't the standard, but you'll certainly see them pop up. Waft has always been an amazing move that's been held back a bit by a lot of the rest of Wario's kit being unremarkable, but in Ultimate, where he actually has a lot of really strong tools to go alongside it, yikes. Snake's best move is the one that completely dictates the pace of every game he plays, his grenades. At a glance, this projectile seems relatively innocuous. Snake can't dictate when it goes off, its damage and knockback are pretty modest, and it damages him too. Then you start thinking about how it spawns on frame 1, faster than any air dodge in the game, and attacking it sets it off even if Snake is still holding it, giving him a combo breaker that few characters can match up with. Or the fact that on top of having three different trajectories it can be thrown in, and being able to walk back and forth while holding an active grenade out, Snake can also drop it with shield and even pick it back up afterwards, meaning that its placement is actually incredibly fluid. Tried to attack him or his shield while he was holding a grenade? Well, that was probably a mistake, especially when considering that the grenade's relatively low knockback actually makes it great for setting up into his devastating aerials. You can't attack Snake like any other character, and learning to space around the grenades is a big part of learning the matchup. God, Brawl players were smug about this in the early Ultimate days. You can't even pummel him if he's holding a grenade, just grab and throw. Be careful not to get grabbed by him if he's approaching with a grenade in hand, though. Remember, anything that cancels into shield cancels into grab. And then to top things off, grenades are also B-reversible, giving Snake a mix-up and disadvantage that he sorely needs. It's true that Snake will usually take a fair amount of grenade damage himself over the course of a match, but he's a heavy character with a particularly lethal arsenal, so both players being hit simultaneously works in his favor more often than not. The magic number is 160%, because after opponents reach that he has a universal kill confirm with down throw into up tilt, but moves like raw up tilt, or Nikita in disadvantage state, also heavily incentivize building opponents' damage up at any cost, an area that grenades excel in. Pre-patch Icon Ultimate was unanimously understood to be Neutral Air, the character, and even though Neutral Air received a nerf to its combo potential later on in the game's life, it's still Ike's best move. A lot of its combo potential remains intact, from simple early percent bread and butters, to ladder combos at mid percent, to some kill confirms later on that did survive the nerf. Up air confirms actually start killing earlier now because Neutral Air pops opponents higher up, although this does make the windows a lot tighter than they used to be. Or you can just use the back hit. Its knockback was never touched. Or go for Ether. The same patch that toned down Neutral Air also turned that thing into a beast of a kill move. Assuming you're not in position to just go for an Ether side. That's always been a thing, 
and it's always been funny. Neutral Air is obviously great because of the reward at Grand Psych, but also because it provides an all-encompassing disjoint with massive range and very little landing leg, a tool that not many characters have access to. Now, as a disclaimer, this is largely a landing aerial only. Not entirely, but still dealing with more of a limitation than most Neutral Airs. Its slow speed makes it close to useless out of shield, and while it has some reward when done rising, it becomes much more limited. It's also a move that can be parried more reliably than a lot of aerials, which has become more and more of a serious concern as the meta has evolved. Are these legitimate weaknesses of the move that Ike players need to account for? Sure. Do they make Ike's neutral air anything less than excellent? No. Pokemon Trainer's best move is their down special Pokemon Change, which enables the character's fundamental game plan, but that's a lame answer, so let's do the Pokemon individually instead. I'd give Squirtle's Forward Tilt the title, a fast and very safe combo tool that pairs well with his ground speed. Its most important role by far is leading into grab, because his throws start all of his best low percent combos, and that's the main thing that Squirtle does for the trio. This made me seriously consider one of Squirtle's two combo throws, or one of the several moves they lead into for the title as well, but ultimately, they're a bit interchangeable, and Squirtle needs some kind of way to Pressure shield if he's gonna land grabs to begin with, and forward tilt is custom built for that purpose. It's only 6 frames negative on shield, and that's a number almost unheard of for grounded moves. It's safer than a lot of very good aerials. Forward tilt also enables tech chases later on, and fishing for these tends to be one of the main ways that Squirrel tries to close out stocks, although this wasn't a major consideration given that the other Pokemon tend to cover this area much more. Ivysaur does get a stock taking move for my choice though, her absolutely colossal and absurdly powerful up air. The strength of this move is obvious just by looking at its hitbox. Seriously, what the hell is that? But the downwards momentum that it gives Ivy can also be very useful because it makes ladder combos exceptionally reliable, essentially performing the fast fall for her while she's still in the animation. A lot more leads into up air than simply another up air though, which helps turn Ivy into a very lethal character, not even the area she's necessarily supposed to specialize in. Ivysaur is set up as the zoner of the trio, and I did consider Razor Leaf for the spotlight. It's a great projectile which leads into a lot of powerful combos, but come on. Seriously, look at this thing, there's not even a sour spot on there either. Unlike Charizard's back air, which has a relatively tame sour spot everywhere but at the flaming tip of his tail. Let me tell you though, that flame? That's a hell of a flame, and it's perched on the end of a very long sword-like disjoint. Charizard tends to be the most niche Pokemon of the three, so this was the toughest choice on the list. Part of what he's used for is raw kill power, and that's a base that back air covers incredibly well. That said, you don't just switch to Charizard because you want an early kill. Sometimes it's for his survivability because he's the heaviest of the three. Sometimes you need to switch to him to make it back to the stage or to avoid a combo. Sometimes you just get stuck with him on your rotation back to Squirtle. Charizard isn't always fishing for super early kills, and some very good Pokemon trainer players rarely use them unless they're forced to, in which case it may be more suitable to give the title to his Up Smash, one of the fastest in the game that still serves as a decent kill move. When it comes down to brass tacks though, I think squeezing the most out of Pokemon Trainer means squeezing the most out of every Pokemon, and the players that do make more frequent use of Charizard often do it by abusing back air. Still not the most multifaceted move on this list, but it does what it needs to do. Diddy Kong has been one of the most consistently threatening characters throughout the history of Smash, and a lot of this comes down to the fundamentally oppressive nature of his banana peel. The exact logistics of how it works may have fluctuated over the years, but the core concept of an item that causes opponents to slip, and can therefore combo into his entire moveset, has remained sound every time. Ultimate's iteration has some particularly interesting quirks though. Because the banana no longer clanks with other hitboxes, a property called Transcendent Priority, it deals with a lot of moves in a way that other item projectiles don't. The relatively weak shield game in Ultimate means that access to both Diddy's snappy out of shield toss speed, or his jump into Z drop, are extremely valuable valuable assets. Its most notable trait, though, is that it now lingers even after the first time hitting an opponent, making even the aerial version of the peel a staple combo extender that leads into some of Diddy's best damage. The double toss enables some interesting extensions on platforms as well, particularly by incorporating the pulling animation. Although thankfully, the infinite that Diddy used to be able to do, aka the pyramid scheme, was patched out not long after it was discovered. I heard a lot of people downplay its power for a while, like to a weird degree, but yeah, I don't think that needed to stick around. Even so, the banana peel has a level of sheer versatility all its own, which helps make it one of the best item projectiles in the game once again, a move category that's already very stacked. Lucas has an impressive moveset, I say he's got one of the most underrated kits in the game, and one move that goes seriously above and beyond is his Rope Snake Aerial Tether, or Zare. It's a very solid tether that goes much farther than it looks like it should, a great tool for a character with an otherwise exploitable recovery, while also having low enough knockback to make it a phenomenal combo starter. The X factor of this attack, though, is the way that it interacts with his double jump. Zare can be used to perform a double jump cancel to keep Lucas very low to the ground, which allows him to carry opponents fully across 
across the stage from any position before ending it off with a confirm into something else. Lucas has some of the better edge guarding in the game between special moves like PK Thunder and PK Freeze, or very low hitting normals like Forward Tilt and Down Smash to cover the ledge, so the ability to put opponents into that position from anywhere off a low risk option is fantastic. And I really do mean low risk, the snake is somehow only negative 2 on shield, which also makes it one of the better reversal moves if Lucas finds himself on the ledge. The risk reward for using it is extremely favorable. Double jump cancelling also opens up some other more general mobility options for Lucas, and there's something called the snake dash on top of that. A frame perfect technique that pushes an already technical move even further, but wasn't necessary for the choice. You'd think the character with the fastest ground speed would have a playstyle dominated by grounded normals, but it's actually two special moves, Sonic side special the spin dash and down special the spin charge that he's most known for in Ultimate. Both of these are absurdly useful, quick, versatile burst movement options, both of them start combos that lead to a lot of Sonic's more rewarding plays, and there's more to both of them than first meets the eye. Spin dash has an advanced technique that can be done off stage, but consumes Sonic's double jump. Spin charge's advanced technique has to be done from the ground, but doesn't consume a double jump. Spin charge is also the less committal move if Sonic changes his mind about rushing forward, it positions opponents more reliably since it drags them along with him, the uncharged one is quicker and more direct to initiate, it's got a lot going in its favor. Spin dash, meanwhile, is more committal, but it's also really, really, really good for camping, because it gets invincibility on startup, unlike spin charge, and the hop it does makes it harder to pin down. Sonic already camps when the occasion calls for it, he's the character in Ultimate best known for playing to the clock, but I think if we're talking purely about optimization, then Sonic players should actually be doing it even more. So even though Spin Charge maybe tends to be used a bit more often in practice, I guess I'll give it to Spin Dash… Look, just pick the one you want, we all know they're copy-paste jobs anyways. Choosing a best move for King Dedede turned out to be kind of weird, he's got an unusual playstyle centered around multi-jump mix-ups, but very slow, bobbing multi-jumps on a fast faller, and then ledge trapping afterwards. A lot of his moves are a bit on the situational side and fit comfortably into one of those situations, whereas his inhale, on the other hand, does the job in both phases very comfortably. When mixing up his movement in the air, it means that opponents can't just freely close in on him to catch his landing, not in the face of a b-reversible command grab with a persistent hitbox to catch shields and spot dodges. In the ledge trapping phase, it likewise removes an opponent's ability to safely shield, which can be a big problem against Gordon and the persistent hitbox can catch the vast majority of ledge options an opponent can choose from. They probably won't be super happy to get caught in one closer to the ledge no matter what though. It is an inhale move, and those have been cheesing Smash games up for a very long time. A more recent addition is the move's ability to catch and send back projectiles. In previous Smash games, King DDD struggled enormously against projectile camping, and this new functionality of inhale that Ultimate introduced made that far less of a concern. It even works with his own Gordos, whether he opts to just catch them himself, or defend against an opponent swatting them back at him. Gordos were a very close contender for the choice here, by the way. They're a big part of why DDD's ledge game is so scary, but this ability to send them back is a major liability, and using inhale smartly is a big part of managing that. If we're being literal, Olimar's best move has to be his neutral special, Pikmin Pluck, because he literally wouldn't function as a character without it, and after that his Pikmin Whistle Down special, which is how he organizes them. You know, those are kind of meh, even if the whistle does have armor on it, so I guess I'll talk about a runner-up. That'd have to be side special, the Pikmin Toss. It shares a lot of duties with his forward smash, with both moves being about bombarding your opponent with Pikmin from a distance, but the much higher range of Pikmin Toss makes it safer to use, even if, unlike his smash attack, it doesn't cause flinch with anything besides a purple Pikmin. The damage from latching Pikmin onto his opponent starts racking up very quickly, and they can be beaten away by some characters much better than others, but doing this is disruptive by nature and is even worse because hitting the Pikmin induces hit lag, which slows moves down and messes with timings. On top of being a staple pressure tool, Pikmin tosses range, speed, and aerial usage also make it a very good way to voluntarily sacrifice Pikmin to make room to build a better lineup, something that good Olimar players are very adept at. Lucario's best move in my eyes is undoubtedly Aurasphere, the heartbeat of his kit. As far as these big chargeable ball projectiles go, it's pretty tame at a glance, but as Lucario starts taking damage and his aura mechanic starts kicking in, the projectile grows and becomes stronger. At high aura, it's extremely powerful and large enough to easily hit the ledge, making it one of the scarier projectiles in the game. That's all well and good, but it's the unique charge hitbox which makes Aurasphere distinct from similar attacks, a hitbox which also grows and becomes more dangerous with aura. This can be extremely 
disruptive and has a lot of creative combo routes out of it, many of which end in his opponent's stock evaporating. Aura Sphere would be a great asset on any character, but because Lucario in particular has some of the best air physics in the game, it gets all the stronger, as B reversing and jump cancelling become fantastic movement tools. This is all after Aura Sphere was nerfed in a patch to bring its hit stun down, which did hurt, there's no sugarcoating that, but it's still not a move that you can underestimate. Rob has kind of an insane toolkit, and a lot of his best plays involve stringing multiple potent tools together in interesting ways, but Neutral Air is so good in so many scenarios that I just had to go with it. While slow to start up and vulnerable to parrying compared to many of its peers, if it's not parried, it's rare for it to ever be punished with its ludicrously low end lag and great range. And for that matter, sometimes even if it is parried. The range of the flame combined with the flip that Rob performs gives it fantastic coverage, which makes it useful in everything from neutral to ledge trapping, juggling to getting juggled, and connecting it allows Rob to combo into a lot of simple stuff, notably including his highly damaging and potentially even lethal rotor arm, to much more complicated, extended kill confirms that incorporate Zed Drop Gyro in various ways. These types of combos may look like one of those fancy maybe in the future things I've been bringing up throughout the video, but a lot of them actually aren't that hard to do, and you already see them pop up quite frequently in high-level play. This is not theoretical tech. The main issue here is actually with the gyro itself. Rob's going to be holding it less often than most item projectiles because there's setup time involved. I do think that just blatantly fishing for neutral air combos like Rob tends to do is probably going to keep getting less viable over time as people continue to work parrying into their game plan more, which means you could argue in favor of something like his notoriously safe and rewarding down tilt, which I think is Rob's highest quality standalone move, or the gyro, which is fantastic even even with that setup requirement. Take a look at any Rob match though, and you're going to see Neutral Air being used as the answer for a dumb amount of situations. Including killing. It also kills. He needs it. Toon Link is the quickest of the three links that we now have in Ultimate, which he abuses to great effect with his bomb. He has no trouble creating openings to pull one before throwing it and rushing in behind it, and it's set up to be one of the best straightforward combo projectiles in the game with its low knockback growth and great launch angle. At low percents it leads into a pretty solid combo game, and this only gets better as an opponent's percentage climbs. Later on, bomb into forward air in particular is something of a signature kill confirm. Bombs can also be planted on the ground, or thrown into the air as delayed traps for some added utility, and you can do a bit of fancy stuff with them thanks to how floaty they are, allowing for some regrab sequences and the like. That's all good stuff, but just the fundamental nature of a safe projectile that's rewarding on hit is enough to give the slot to bombs. This really applies to his bow and boomerang as well. As the fastest link with the slowest, floatiest, most persistent projectiles, he's by far the best of the three at putting up that traditional zoner sludge for an opponent to wade through. That said, bombs do it best and are usually the scariest to misstep against. Wolf's an interesting character, clearly meant to be a brawler, but also pulling in bits and pieces from the Swordfighter handbook, and Forward Air showcases this well. It's an arcing claw slash with a sword-like disjoint that starts combos in the same vein as something like Sheik's. A hard mix to complain about. It's amazing just how many things this combos into, from simple Forward Air chains across the stage, to a delayed Up Air if you see an opportunity to start a ladder combo, to Down Air for a kill opportunity off stage or just to kill some characters outright, to Back Air for one of Wolf's most ubiquitous kill confirms. A lot of these work because Wolf is another character with incredible air physics, a trait which also makes the threat bubble of this move a lot bigger. Everything I've listed would be considered bread and butter for any solid Wolf player, but at just the right percent, you can opt for wilder stuff like forward air into Wolf Flash kamikazes, or even forward air into back air into Wolf Flash. You know, just in case you were feeling... Flashy. Shut up, man! Shut up! Forward air is an indispensable part of both Wolf's simplest fundamentals and his most degenerate nonsense. Sounds like a good move to me. While we're on forward airs, Villager has an unusual projectile on his which does a great job keeping opponents away. It's got a bit of combo use to boost it in the rankings, and its close range sweet spot will also kill eventually, but really, its primary goal is mid range harassment, and it's good at its job. Villager's got a bit of an approach game if he wants it, but he's a zoner when all's said and done. What better way to show that off than by letting him shoot you even while he's in the air? Well, actually, maybe by letting him shoot you while he's in the air and his back is facing you. This slingshot concept gets shared with his back air, and they each have their own nuances. Back air does a bit more damage than forward air can manage, which adds up over a match, and kills more effectively with its close range sweet spot, but is also slightly slower to come out and less safe on shield. Although with projectile aerials, that's a bit less of a concern than usual. They still do essentially the same thing, so you can make an argument for choosing a more distinct move, as if they lost access to one, they could just kind of keep on trucking with the other. I downplayed the Lloyd Rocket earlier. 
Warrior is actually kind of an insane approach tool that a lot of characters would kill for and that Villager does make good use of, but a lot of what he's doing with it is supporting his slingshot. That mid-range strategy is just so fundamental to his playstyle. You can honestly think of both slingshot moves as a package deal, I'm just choosing what I think is the slightly better one to fit the format of the video, and forward air speed and extra bit of utility and combos gives it the edge, even if back air might be slightly higher quality standalone. Both of them are pretty much equally annoying, and at the end of the day, that's their ultimate purpose. While we're on annoying things, Mega Man once again excels in the mid-range game, this time thanks to a non-stop barrage from his Mega Buster, a move that he splits between jab, forward tilt, and neutral air. Neutral air is the best of the three. It's inherently got better coverage, with less commitment, and has a separate launcher hitbox closer to Mega Man that the grounded moves lack. This is another projectile that primarily excels at harassment without too much additional utility to worry about on top of that. The lemons never let an opponent feel like they've got room to breathe, and a lot of his other moves are great at punishing attempts to try and get around them. A close Honorable mention to Metal Blade here. It has way more utility, and I certainly did consider it, but the Mega Buster is just way too integral to Mega Man's game plan. We Fit Trainer's header is a move with a simple concept throw a ball at your opponent. Throwing stuff at your opponent is usually a good idea in Smash, and this does it well, but take a closer look, and it starts getting deeper than that. It grants her quite a bit of air stall, which works for offstage situations like edge guarding, recovering, or chucking balls at your opponent from the ledge, but on top of that, it also enables combos if you hit your opponent with it at close range, which there are setups into. Or if you hit the close range sweet spot, the header itself can also spike. And that's just if you opt for the full move. We Fit Trainer can also cancel the launch early, which leaves the ball free to be manipulated in all sorts of interesting ways by her unorthodox yoga pose attacks. This isn't nearly as big a staple for Wii Fit Trainer as it is for some other characters with manipulable projectiles, but there's still plenty of opportunity for tricky plays. Add all these up, and whether we're talking the most out there setups or straightforward plays that Wii Fit Trainer wants to make, Hitter consistently appears as a centerpiece. I know a lot of people will argue in favor of Deep Breathing, which was upgraded in Ultimate to give her what is, yes, some undeniably strong damage and kill power while the buff is active. That while its active part is the catch though, We Fit Trainer is ultimately only going to have the buff for a small portion of the match and she's not well equipped to force a lot of interactions while she does. She's not that quick even with the speed boost that it provides and her hitboxes aren't that big. In practice, its biggest role is less the dramatic combo stuff and more turning We Fit Trainer from a character who can really struggle to kill into a character with pretty reasonable kill power. That's certainly good, and it's obviously a good move, but it doesn't magically solve all of her problems and I'd still say that Header is more impactful on average. For Rosalina, I'd probably have to give the title to Neutral Special, Luma Shot, and Luma Recall, but as with Olimar or Pokemon Trainer, I'm gonna try and avoid this kind of basic functionality move. Instead, let's go with her Neutral Air. Rosalina's Neutral Air is about as straightforward as it comes. It's an all-encompassing circle with her disjointed wand, and its knockback is low enough to create combos at a wide range of percents. Those traits are already very good, but of course, we also need to add Luma into the mix, which comes with a different Neutral Air of its own. This adds a lot more damage to the attack, and Luma's gentle hit can rely chain into Rosalina's to make the most of it. Then we start getting into the more complicated stuff, like the fact that Rosalina can initiate a dash attack and then cancel hers with a jump, but Luma will continue its own dash attack. There's a lot of cool stuff you can do with this, it's called an attack cancel and Rosalina makes the best use of it of anyone in the game, but neutral air is a fantastic one for all-purpose coverage, just look at how much space this takes up and how many options it can pin down both during the attack and in the scenario it sets up. And neutral air is also one of the best tools for something called a lunar landing, another way to desync the two characters by initiating a neutral air just before Rosalina touches the ground. Her attack won't come out, but Luma's will, and you can even desync them while she's stuck in freefall to get some protection on the way down. Again, desyncs can be and are done with other aerials as well, but neutral air's combination of coverage and follow-up potential makes it a go-to. Rosalina's a walling character, and it's a wall that Luma helps build, and both of their neutral airs put in a lot of work in different ways. Little Mac has some pretty notorious moves in Smash, including his incredibly dangerous forward smash, which comes equipped with traits like armor and shield breaking potential, and of course his infamous KO Punch, one of the most polarizing moves in Smash history. Those are great moves, and probably the first ones that pop into people's heads when they think of him, but I think his best move is something a bit more subdued, the Jolt Haymaker. As great as Little Mac's forward smash may be, in my opinion it's the best one in the game if looked at in a vacuum, in practice Mac still tends to lean on his tilts much more often, and Jolt Haymaker is a big part of what he's trying to earn from this for a long time. Its great vertical coverage is what enables this, and that makes it a fast, powerful burst movement tool with anti-air properties on top, a potent combination. It beats basically any movement option other than running directly away from it, and it also beats a lot more attacks than it looks like it should due to a very generous disjoint on the hitbox. 
Oh, and invincibility on the first few frames. That doesn't hurt either. It can easily cover an entire platform as well, a position Little Mac is good at putting opponents in, and one that they'll often voluntarily retreat to themselves in the matchup. Having what's functionally a surrogate aerial quite often, and a really good one at that, is a powerful tool for a character who famously has the worst traditional aerials in the series history. And, of course, it's also a recovery option, and a pretty solid one because it doesn't put Mac into freefall, giving him recovery mix-ups that are trickier to cover than they may first appear. Now, he doesn't get Jolt Haymaker back even if he's hit out of it until he touches the ground, which is a major weakness most recovery moves don't have that essentially turns it into a death sentence if exploited, but it's still pretty good for recovery duties in a video that doesn't take recovery into heavy consideration. That's not to say that Little Mac has one of the game's best recoveries, clearly he doesn't, but Jolt Haymaker is the last thing to blame there. From just starting to get his gloves dirty, to when he's starting to look for kills, to when his opponent is trying to kill him, Jolt Haymaker is frequently the saving grace at all stages of Little Mac's game, which in my eyes gives it the edge over more exciting moves that come up more often in conversations about him. Greninja was an interesting one because his mobility is probably his greatest asset. He has some very good moves with high reward, but they tend to be fairly specific, requiring him to abuse his movement to get into just the right spot first. Greninja's dash attack is one of his more forgiving moves though, while still providing great reward and allowing him to take advantage of his movement. It's one of the fastest and safest dash attacks in the game, and a phenomenal whiff punisher as a result. At early percent, it starts a lot of his most important combos, most notably leading into up air, which can result in a very long chain and potentially even death. It's a very good move in its own right that likewise pairs well with Greninja's great movement, in this case his jump height. Later on, Dash Attack's true combo potential admittedly does start fading, but even without a guaranteed kill, it still works well to create 50-50s and various other setups that he can take advantage of. Neutral are true combos for much longer and was a good contender in its own right, but it requires very tight spacing and isn't effective at all as a rising tool, contributing to Greninja's weak options if he's pinned down and forced to shield. It's a great pressure tool if his opponent is the one shielding, but Dash Attack's long burst range and quick frame data can make it surprisingly slippery in this role as well. Smash Ultimate is full of this kind of flying sidekick neutral air, and they're basically all very good. I'm actually surprised it's taken this long to elect one properly. The drought ends here, though. Me Brawler's neutral air is absurd, even among its peers. Its frame data is amazing, coming out in a measly three frames, and its sweet spot is only negative two on shield, so literally nothing in the entire game can punish it if it's spaced properly. Its sour spot isn't far behind at only negative three, either. That sour spot is the real moneymaker here. It's got so little knockback that Me Brawler can combo out of it for an exceptionally long time, into everything from his burst option special moves to his potent smash attacks. Pair that with a blistering fastfall speed that makes him more than primed to mix up aerials with unreactable timing, and you've got a golden example of this ubiquitous move. Anytime Brawler is in your face, he feels incredibly oppressive. Not to write off the sweet spot, mind you. It's even got some kill power to go with that exceptional safety. I looked at a variety of his other great up-close attacks, which there are a fair amount of, as well as the faint jump, his Zero Suit Samus knockoff, but me Brawler came to brawl, and neutral air does the job like nothing else. Me Sword Fighter was a tricky one, because out of all the Mii's, I think he's the one where moves power levels vary the most depending on what other moves he's running. It's also a bit of a weird case, because despite literally having Sword Fighter in the name, this character frequently plays more like a zoner than anything else. And yet trying to choose a zoning tool is hard. Gale Strike is one of his more common specials that you see pop up, a slow moving combo projectile, but it's also not very safe kind of hard to land sometimes, and is competing with the shuriken of light for the neutral special slot. And the more time goes on, the more I think that opting for the shuriken is a totally valid option, and potentially even the better one. And yet if you choose to go with that, then suddenly Chakram, a move I was also considering, starts to become a bit redundant. Even if its soft throw combo ability still lets it do something totally unique. Then when it comes to actual sword moves, you've got Down Tilt, which has genuinely excellent frame data and some reward, but that reward just starts falling off way too quickly. It's safe, but it spends the majority of the game doing a few percent and putting opponents into a mediocre disadvantage state that Swordfighter isn't the best at capitalizing on, not quite cutting it. Then there's his odd Link-inspired forward air, which has some pretty good drag down stuff, but this isn't that safe to go for, and in more general terms, the move's not too exciting. A bit slow and stubby without incredible reward. I think I've got to go with up air here. In a vacuum, this is an excellent aerial. It kills fairly early with its sweet spot, then has a lingering sour spot that enables combo. On Mii Swordfighter's kit specifically, it's not put to its best use unless he's specifically chosen Gale Strike, where it then becomes a staple confirm, because otherwise Swordfighter's limited mobility can make it rough to get the narrow hitbox underneath an opponent. It's still something he does though, rough doesn't mean impossible, so it's at least reasonable as a standalone move outside of moveset synergy. Oh, and for anyone who wants to bring the down throw up air kill confirm into play… 
Yeah, sorry, that's not really a thing. It'll catch people off guard who don't know the matchup, which to be fair is a good chunk of them, but simply DIing away kills it completely, and Swordfighter doesn't have a powerful forward throw that would punish DIing away and force 50-50s in the same way that, say, the pits can near the ledge. Provided you know this and can react to the entire sequence of being grabbed and thrown, you'll be fine. That's not to say it's never gonna work, though. Not only is it a rare matchup, but the down throw animation is also pretty quick, reactable in a lab consistently, but not always under the cognitive load of a stressful tournament set. Second choice here is actually one of Me Sword Fighter's up specials, the Skyward Slash Dash, a move that I was seriously considering to the point where it showed up in one draft of the script. Between its fast startup, great travel distance, freely selectable angle, and coverage in front from the sword, I think I'd actually call it one of the best pure recovery moves in the game. It's a solid burst option on top of that, and you see this pop up pretty frequently, and its multi-hit nature can also be abused to score some janky kills. That said, recovery isn't my biggest concern, and while this is probably the least contested of any of his special move slots, you still do occasionally see a Swordfighter player pull out something else and do work with it, even if the Skyward Slash Dash is relatively ubiquitous at this point. He's always going to have up air, and it's always going to have weight behind it, so it's the choice, but I've got to say, this one was closer than I expected. Forward air encapsulates what Me Gunner is all about. Shooting stuff? and running away. The shooting stuff comes from its exceptional range, which, believe it or not, is actually a nerf from its previous appearance, but still plenty enough to provide pressure at a distance. The running away part comes from the recoil it creates, which can be used to provide mobility options that are pretty much unique among this category of move. Gunner has some very good projectile specials as well, like you'd expect from a pure zoner, but it's a bit hard to single just one of them out. There are multiple very valid choices in each move slot and some of them work very well alongside forward air. It's a signature move for the character no matter what moveset she's rocking, a mid-range harassment tool like we've already looked at, with additional utility. Palutena has a famously forgiving and rewarding neutral air that creates unreasonable damage output early on, allowing for a single move to easily lead into 50% or more. After that initial burst of damage though, I think that back air is actually the more impactful move for more of the game. This does pretty much everything you could ever ask an aerial to do. It's fast, it's safe, it's a combo starter at earlier percents, a combo ender for longer than that, and then a kill move later on. And of course, it's another aerial with a unique trait, in this case the invincibility that the shield provides, meaning that Palutena is essentially unchallengeable from positions that no other character can replicate, in the air and on the ground. It'd be exaggerating to say that the invincibility constantly comes into play directly, but part of this is because it fundamentally changes how her nope. opponents have to interact with her. When you're facing Palutena's back, you're not just free to attack her. If you do, and you guess wrong on the timing, she wins that exchange. Simple as that. And her opponent knows this, and she knows that her opponent knows this, which she can then exploit. Yeah, that's pretty good. And it's just one more good thing getting stacked on top of the move's already great properties for winning exchanges in neutral. It's frame data. It's disjoint. Neutral air was obviously still a heavy contender despite everything that back air brings to the table, and not just because of its early loops, although those don't hurt. There's no stage of the game where it becomes a bad or even average move. There aren't many frame 5 persistent disjoints you'd be able to say that about, and it's even got drag down setups alongside that, and a universal kill confirm into up tilt. Back air is a workhorse juggernaut and one of the best walling aerials in Ultimate though, especially when paired with Palutena's high air acceleration, allowing her to weave in and out and threaten a huge amount of space with little commitment. Pac-Man is a character that takes a lot of brain power to master, and this largely comes from the ridiculous amount of options and setups that Bonus Fruit provides. He gets to choose the one he wants, he gets to store it for later, and they all have a place. The first several fruits provide straightforward, no-nonsense pressure with a variety of very useful travel arcs. The Melon provides a persistent, lethal trap. Galaxian provides silly combos that a zoner has no right to be doing at any time, for any reason. Bell is possibly the scariest of all of them, a simple stun tool with great coverage that Pac-Man can take fantastic advantage of. And Key is an even simpler, fast, and extremely dangerous item toss. It's when they start interacting with his other moves like the Hydrant with its collision physics, or Power Pellet to enable scarier kill confirms that can be extended to places he normally couldn't reach, when you start to really appreciate just how insane Bonus Fruit actually is. This this gets exaggerated even further by Pac-Man's floaty physics, great recovery, and an ability to hide behind his hydrant, making it easy to find time to snag just the fruit that he wants. Pac-Man is kind of a strange design in Ultimate. He's a zoner who also has amazing close quarters tools and arguably the best grab in the game, but he's still considered to be a zoner first and foremost. Bonus fruit is just that good. 
Robin's another character with some great melee tools when the Leaven Sword is up and running, but is again a zoner at heart, and Arc Fire is a hell of a zoning tool. Its persistent, large hitbox makes it one of Ultimate's better ledge trapping options, and that persistence also pressures opponents into shield, and makes it one of Robin's better combo starters. The high starting point of the move is a good part of what makes it so strong, as it creates a diagonal angle which covers a lot of airspace. This also allows Robin to chain one Arc Fire into another high into the air, before finishing things off with that aforementioned Leaven Sword. Leaven Sword attacks are are undoubtedly a big part of what Robin's looking to land, but with such poor movement, using projectiles either to facilitate approaches or force more predictable approaches from an opponent can make this go a lot smoother. As a result, the other competitor for the title was unsurprisingly Robin's Thunder Tome, but I think Arcfire does the job a bit better. Both tomes have a resource management component, like the majority of Robin's moves, which is undeniably a negative balancing factor overall, but it does at the very least create a book that can be thrown at people. The Fire Tome has a reasonably generous limit on it, and it's only shared with Robin's fiery jab, a solid move in its own right, but hardly a staple of the character. Yeah, Shulk's best move is Monado Arts. I think most Ultimate players know the drill here. Buster Art creates exceptionally oppressive combos with Shulk's reduced knockback and increased damage output. Speed Art makes him a menace on the ground, Jump Art a menace in the air. Smash Art gives him some of the best kill power in the entire game and even turns his throws into kill throws, a huge deal for a character who can force opponents to shield so easily. And as for shield art... That's right, we're gonna cheat. Yeah, Monado arts can be activated even when Shulk is in hit stun, a bizarre trait that he puts to great use with shield art in particular to break out of combos and kill confirms that literally any other character would be stuck in. And then the really crazy stuff starts coming out, like Malk which cancels the lag he'd normally suffer when landing an aerial into the animation of a Monado art activating. This animation is fully interruptible, which makes his already safe aerials even safer. Or buffer deactivation, where you start cancelling out of a Monado art during another animation, queuing you up to get, say, the reduced knockback of buster art on one hit to let it combo into another attack, and then let the attack it combos into rip at full power. Or dial storage, where Shulk can open the Monado wheel part way, cancel the animation, and then for some reason the time he spent doing that is credited to him the next time he goes to open the wheel. And because opening the wheel cancels all landing lag, being able to do it quickly creates some pretty nutty stuff like melee-esque wave dashes. There's way more to it than I'm gonna try and cover here. Smash 4 Shulk was better known for abusing advanced Monado tech as the bust to Shulk's frame data and the arts themselves in Ultimate made it less necessary. That means he's a masher now. But there is definitely a lot to dig your teeth into as a Shulk main if you do want to go for it. Not that any of this really makes that much of a difference anyways, even at the most barebones fundamental level, Monado Arts is still easily one of the most broken moves in Smash history. Bowser Jr.'s game plan is largely centered around his side special, the Clown Cart Dash. It's a crucial mobility tool between its speed and ability to be cancelled into a jump, a jump that, notably, doesn't take up Jr.'s double jump if done in the air. The mobility of the Clown Cart does a solid job compensating for what would otherwise be an extremely sluggish character, and this jump cancel ability also allows it to be used as a good combo tool if its lingering hitbox connects. The cart can additionally be cancelled with a skid maneuver that comes with a much stronger hitbox, a bit of a risky option, but potentially a very rewarding one. One. The skid has its place in mobility as well because it doesn't prevent Junior from spawning another card afterwards, meaning that if he pulls out all the stops on what the move is capable of, he can cover some very impressive distances. And moving around gets even easier thanks to a bit of armor on the cart. This armor doesn't come into play that often, it'll only block moves that deal around 10% and doesn't apply to Junior himself, just the cart. But it's a nice bonus thrown onto what's already a very good tool, despite also having a fantastic, disjointed, combo-oriented up air that frequently starts opponent stocks off at 60 plus damage damage, or a projectile trap that doubles up as a traditional item pull, mobility makes everything else in your kit better, and the clown card dash is the key to creating many opportunities for those other moves to shine. Duck Hunt's Trick Shot is one of the more interesting and skill-testing projectiles in the game, spawning an explosive can that gets continuously shot by pressing the special button again, and works even if Duck Hunt is performing a different action. This unique functionality and malleability makes it a staple of pretty much everything Duck Hunt wants to do. Their neutral is centered around manipulating the can. Most of their best combos are focused around knocking an opponent into the can. They use the can when they're recovering to make challenging them difficult. They use the can to intercept opponents who are trying to recover, and because it spawns on frame one, it can be used similarly to Snake's Grenades, to mutually assured destruction themselves out of combos that most characters couldn't escape from. How well you manipulate the can probably determines how good of a Duck Hunt player you are. It's a move that starts off melting your brain, but then does the same to your opponent once you start getting control over it. Ryu and Ken are a bit of a difficult case. Do you opt for their insanely powerful pressure and combo tools, or their exceptionally powerful kill options? 
Let's split things down the middle. Ken is typically considered to be the more aggressive of the two, and also tends to have a bit more of a focused goal. Landa Shoryuken. He's got a lot of very solid ways to confirm into it, and unlike Ryu, the multi-hit nature of the fiery Shoryuken makes it natural to throw out as an invincible anti-air even against very high opponents, as the rising hits always lead into the potent finisher. Well, that's the theory anyways. The move is very good, but yeah, it does have consistency issues. This multi-hit nature also sets it up well to take advantage of Ken's ladder combos that he can perform with his upwards kick, which Ryu can kind of replicate, but not nearly as routinely or impressively. And finally, is obviously a recovery move, and while its trajectory is pretty limited, it does offer some protection with its high hitbox, even if that's not necessarily always the absolute best thing to have. Ryu, meanwhile, has a bit more of a diverse and goal than Ken for the most part. He can and frequently does use Shoryuken, but a lot of the time he'll also end up opting for Tatsumaki. So instead I'll choose a move that routinely leads into both of these, Down Tilt. With the ability to cancel it into special moves, a trait unique to the traditional fighting game characters in Ultimate, this would already be one of the best grounded moves in the game, let alone coming with a hard and soft variant to choose from, the latter of which having some of Ultimate's absolute best frame data on any attack, period. Oh, that's right, he also cheats thanks to the auto-turnaround mechanic that both Ryu and Ken get in solo fights. Ryu is more of a neutral-focused character than Ken, and a lot of that comes from the great pressure that his neutral special Hadouken and Shokunetsu provides, but I definitely think Down Tilt is the more impactful move overall. If I were going to make any change to this segment, it'd actually be to also give Ken the Down Tilt nod, it's not like he doesn't abuse the hell out of it too, but it's close, so let's diversify things a little. Cloud has an impressive set of aerials overall, as with many sword fighters in Ultimate, it's a keystone of the archetype, but even among this crowd, his back air is close to being in a league of its own. It's huge. It basically just doesn't have landing leg, which makes it negative 3 on shield and gives it nasty combo potential at earlier percents. And then it also starts killing quite early despite how good a combo tool it starts out as. Not much more needs to be said here. There's very little downside to spamming back air as much as humanly possible, and Spargo, the best cloud player in the world, is famous for how much and how effectively he abuses it. Even among sword fighters with their suite of great aerials, Corrin is especially guilty of throwing them out constantly, and up air is extra noteworthy for this purpose. Corrin's moveset is largely built around popping opponents upwards, and this means that whether we're talking about true combos or stray hits, up air frequently comes into play both as a combo enabler and as a juggling tool. With its mix of great speed, outrageous coverage, and shockingly high power, power that defies both the lackadaisical animation of the move and all of the other great attributes it already brought to the table, it's suited for these purposes in a Way that few attacks would be. Its amazing hitbox also notably makes it particularly good at being used on the way down. Don't get me wrong, most sword arcs are used in this way, but a lot of the time they can feel a bit more awkward and specific to land than they intuitively should, whereas this up air feels extremely generous, and has great reward for a long time. This includes comboing into one of the strongest and safest back airs in the game, a move I was also considering, but up air plays to core and strengths a little bit better and has more use cases overall. Neutral air and forward air are part of what provide that strength, both being great launchers with massive hitboxes and are certainly high quality moves, but I think up air is a little higher quality. And again, the main thing that you're looking to set up into with those is up air and then ideally more up airs. Bayonetta is a very combo centric character and there are two moves most responsible for this. Witch Twist, her up special, and Afterburner Kick, her side special. Realistically, she absolutely needs both, so there's not too much point settling on just one, but since I have to, I'll say Afterburner Kick. It's the biggest single boost of mobility that she gets, which also means it's a bit more useful as a standalone combo extender alongside other moves, especially because it's less susceptible to SDI, and breaking your analog stick is an infamously crucial aspect of fighting her. On the other hand, Witch Twist is a 6 frame out of shield option that she can use multiple times in the air, so really we're splitting hairs here. I originally planned to give the title to Witch Twist solely because Afterburner Kick becomes Heal Slide if done on the ground, and out of the three this is by far the weakest of them, so it comes down to whether you count Afterburner Kick and Heal Slide as two separate moves, which yeah, I'm willing to. Inkling can be a very slippery character to try and get your hands on, and some of this comes from her uniquely evasive movement, but it also comes from how amazingly safe back air is. With a great disjoint and minuscule landing leg that makes it negative 2 on shield, it joins the elusive nothing in the game can punish me club, and connecting it leads into combos for an impressively long time because of how low the knockback on the sour spot in particular is. Now, this knockback is definitely a weakness as well. Inkling can have a hard time taking stocks, and having a combo-oriented back air is a big part of that, the vast majority of them are kill moves. Having a heck of a time killing is Barking Frog. It does at least start tech chases for a long time. No substitute for direct killing, but it's something, and it's also a solid edge guarding move, which Inkling can do very comfortably. 
really took some time to think about, but I ended up going with this funny looking forward tilt. The animation may not look like much, but if you take a look at the hitbox, you can see that it's far bigger and more disjointed than you might expect, and the tipper sweet spot is very forgiving. It's also pretty fast by Ridley standards at frame 10, and negative 10 on shield is quite good for a grounded move. A lot of characters would have trouble punishing it even without that exceptional range. This makes forward tilt spammable in the neutral, but one of its greatest strengths is using it to intercept opponents who are trying to recover. The downward variant sticks well past and below the ledge for multiple frames, making it a nasty two-frame tool. Ridley's unusual neutral air was a contender here as well. Despite all the size comments made about him over the years, a lot of his kit doesn't actually cover nearly as much space as you might expect, and neutral air is a prominent exception that sees a lot of use. Forward tilt gets plenty of use of its own though, and the thing is, a good amount of what neutral air does is just knock opponents off stage, which Ridley routinely covers with both neutral air and forward tilt, but neutral air simply resets the situation again while forward tilt is what actually closes out the stock. Neutral air does have some modest combo potential, a nice application that forward tilt lacks entirely, although its knockback is horizontal and moderate, and this limits the scenarios that it can combo in, especially with a tipper sweet spot that Ridley doesn't always want and can be a bit hard to control. It doesn't help that the move is just barely safer on shield than forward tilt. You generally expect to see much more of a discrepancy between aerials and grounded moves. It's still a good staple tool, and the decision was close. In a case like this, I'd say the better of these two really fluctuates depending on the matchup, but I think forward tilt's quality is a bit higher standalone, so it takes the lead. Simon and Richter's Cross may not be the first boomerang style move that we've seen in Smash, but it's got some of the most interesting applications. What really sets the cross apart is that it perfectly maintains its trajectory pretty much at all times. It doesn't track where the Belmonts are at all on its return journey, it just continues in a straight line, which makes the returning cross a highly consistent threat that opponents constantly have to be wary of, and one that Belmont mains are constantly prepared to capitalize on, with some of the most elaborate and interesting setups that any zoner character has access to. Even if the cross hits their opponent, reverse cross remains in the picture because it just keeps on chugging along. And in fact, once the reverse motion starts, it gets even more resilient and starts eating through moves that would have blocked it on its way out. That's not to downplay the cross's use as a typical projectile, which it also does well, but the sheer space coverage is what gives it the edge. And it's extra useful on characters like the Belmonts who struggle to approach but thrive once they've cornered their opponents, both of which are scenarios that the cross helps cover. The Belmonts have attacks that cover a lot of scenarios better, their long whip strikes for the space at their sides, holy water to keep opponents stuck on the ledge, but Cross can touch all those bases and then some, and using it in tandem with the more specific tools is a key part of generating their fantastic pressure. Or avoiding pressure, you regularly see the Belmonts using the reverse Cross to help themselves out of sticky situations as well. King K. Rule actually has a boomerang of his own, one that comes with a hefty dose of armor and some interesting tech behind it, although I'm gonna go with another armored move, Neutral Air. As a super heavyweight fast faller, King K. Rule should get absolutely torn to shreds in disadvantage state. And while I'm not saying he's the best character at landing on the roster, Neutral Air is an invaluable move for evening this out. The armor of course has its weaknesses, it's only active on his belly and if it takes too much abuse it'll break and leave him wide open, traits that are shared among the majority of his many armor moves, but in practice neither of these tend to be major issues. Outside of the disadvantage help, Neutral Air's armor also makes it a strong edge guarding move that can beat out a lot of recovery attempts, and if connected on the ground, it's a surprisingly good combo tool. This comes from a patch that significantly reduced its landing leg, giving him more time to act and also making it far safer on shield, now being only negative 4 with the sweet spot. Isabel. Yeah, sorry for the bland option, but I think I've just got to go with forward air again, for all the same reasons as Villager. I think that Isabel's frame 3 combo enabling jab is by far the most powerful move in her kit when judged standalone, but she's forced to lean on ledge trapping and some admittedly nice platform setups to make the most of it because she has nothing, and I mean literally nothing to force her way in, not even a Lloyd Rocket to run behind like Villager gets. Instead, her Lloyd Rocket gets planted in the ground as a trip mine, and I did consider it, she always wants to have one up and connecting it provides a lot of reward because of how long opponents are stuck for. It's just a bit too exploitable with its delayed detonation though, along with how easy it is to destroy. It provides good stage control, but nothing outrageously oppressive. And even then, a big part of what she wants to do is camp behind it and fire off the slingshot. Her fishing rod was in the picture as well. It's a good backup recovery move, and she gets a lot of reward off landing it, although she's not the best at setting up situations where it will land in the first place. And at early percents, the reward is forward air. If it went through shields, it'd be her best move hands down, but it doesn't, and if we're being honest, that's probably pretty good for the game's health. Yeah, forward air it is. Isabel has even more of an incentive to play from a distance than Villager does, and her slingshot is a massive part of why that strategy works. 
Incineroar's kit is fantastic, so much so that even a character with the worst mobility in the entire game can go on some strong tournament runs. An impressive accomplishment considering how crucial movement is in Smash. My choice here was split between two moves, the one that really punishes opponents for trying to keep him out, and the one that really rewards him for getting in. I'm opting for the latter and saying that Incineroar's best move is a lull and whip. His flying command grab side special that kills outrageously early off the side blast zone, can also set up juggles and kills off the top, or can be used to force an opponent further off stage, depending on which timing Incineroar chooses for his follow-up after the initial grab. Getting the option that you want means getting consistent with the timing you want, but for an experienced Incineroar player, this should happen the vast majority of the time. The window for the sweet spot back hit is generous enough, even if the timing does change by character a bit, and the others are no-brainers. Now, Alolan Whip's best reward comes from first buffing Incineroar with Revenge, and as a frame 3 counter that punishes opponents for trying to zone or juggle the slowest character in Ultimate. Not calling it his best move definitely took some thought, it's part of why Incineroar is able to get in and line up so many Alolan Whips to begin with. Exactly how good it is tends to vary a lot by matchup, though. It is a counter move, and comes with the inherent risks of any counter if it's used against melee attacks, and a lot of the time its practical payoffs can feel a bit fair, with Alolan Whip being a massive exception. The way that it scales with Revenge is intentionally over the top and provides Incineroar with among the highest single hit damage any character in the game can muster. And Alolan Whip is a recovery move too. It's not a great one, barely goes anywhere, but at least it doesn't put him into freefall, and Incineroar takes what he can get. Piranha Plant is a character that's often inspired mixed opinions regarding its viability over the years, but whether you're a believer or a doubter, I've never heard anyone try and argue that Patui isn't nuts. It's an arcing projectile with physics, which allows it to cover a lot of space with a huge amount of control over its trajectory, and the reward for connecting it under even this most basic circumstance is very substantial. Connecting it at closer range pleases the plant even more because its massive hit stun makes it a great combo starter and extender. Not bad for a completely disjointed anti-air that does 17%. Piranha Plant is generally less known for extended combos and more for tricky setups and traps though, and again, this largely comes down to the versatility of Patui, used in tandem with moves like Poison Breath to force opponents to pick an option. Or use it to get back onto the stage yourself. It's one of multiple special moves Plant has that comes with an air stall, and the trajectory is great for covering off stage angles regardless of which side Plant is on. This was one of the easiest choices in the video, and that's before we start getting into weird tech with multiple frame perfect inputs like the drop shot or the much funnier sounding Spalo, which makes the attack recover much faster. These are genuinely useful, particularly the Spalo, but god are they hard to actually do. This took a shameful amount of time to capture. Joker. For his neutral special, he wields a gun. That gun is Joker's best move. It's a gun that's disruptive in neutral and racks up free damage. A gun that trivializes the consequences of being in disadvantaged state. A gun that edge guards for him, without any risk, from way above the stage. A gun that provides multiple different ways to augment what was already some of the better mobility that you could find in Ultimate. And in the future, potentially more regular use of the gun loops he can perform that reliably lead into high damage chains or even stock losses. Although for the moment this remains a bit more in theoretical gimmick territory. More conservative footstool out of shield options have made their way into the meta in a larger way though. Back air was the other big contender here primarily because back air with Arsene out is one of the craziest aerials ever put into a smash game, and even if we're talking about Joker's base form, it's still definitely one of his best moves. It's an all-rounder that does most things very well. Gun does get a boost from Arsene as well though, even if it's not as significant, and because Joker is going to be spending more of his time without Arsene, I'd say the better move in his base form is the more impactful one over overall. Is anyone surprised to hear that Hero's Command menu is easily his best move? It's got the obvious flaw of not always giving him what he wants when he wants it because of its random nature, but a lot of the individual spells offered are blatantly overpowered, and it's clearly tuned so that good ones are offered regularly. There are 21 spells available in total, and I'm not going to run down the full list, but for some highlights, on the projectile front you've got Kaboom, a fast explosive with a huge radius that kills very early, and Snooze, a spell that uniquely puts opponents to sleep even if they're in the air. He's got some of the game's better buffs than Psych Up, which gives his next attack much more power both on hit and on shield, Oomph, which just makes his moves crazy overall, Accelerattle, which… I mean, look at this. It opens up all sorts of combos that he's balanced around not being able to do, and Bounce, which completely shuts down all projectiles of any kind. Zoom lets him recover from literally anywhere. Flame Slash grants a monster of a sword swing that can be difficult to dodge because of how ambiguous it is buried in the menu. Whack and Thwack outright steal stocks sometimes, and even if not, they still give Hero some good hitboxes to work with. And then Magic Burst steals stocks in a totally different way. This is all balanced 
out by a mana meter that Hero depletes by using the spells which he shares with other moves, and that's a real weakness, but not enough to stop the command menu from being the focus of what he does. It notably makes Hero inherently solid against a lot of defensive characters, between being able to compete in zoning wars, being able to stack up buffs if left uninterrupted, and of course Bounce doing the job for him, he's not easy to play passively against. Characters that can overwhelm him up close tend to be the ones he struggles with more, but with the power of RNG on his side, any matchup can be a winning matchup. Banjo Kazooie came down to a duel between their two good projectiles, Rear Egg and the Breagle Blaster. Both of them are among the duo's better combo enablers, although the combos that they create are each very different. Both of them take a bit of time to set up, but are oppressive obstacles to try and get past once they are. I think that Rear Egg has more use cases though. It's one of their best ledge trapping tools with its persistence, manipulability, and gentle bouncing travel arc, and the fact that it's easy to catch directly out of the launch means that Banjo Kazooie can arm themselves with a very solid item every time they're sent airborne a feat that the Breagle Blaster doesn't really match. They can even use it for recovery duty. The launch gives them an air stall so that they can catch it, and letting it explode in their hand boosts them up and resets their special moves and air dodge. It takes a bit of practice to do consistently, but it's not bad at all, one of the easier advanced techniques to pop up in this video. Rear Egg is also one of the main enablers for their limited use Wonder Wing, which for the record was never on the shortlist for their best move. A big part of this comes from the fact that despite its invincibility and its high speed and long travel distance, Wonder Wing still just isn't that safe to use. If the opponent simply shields, then they'll have plenty of time to muster a punish up. Let's say you put a bomb right in front of them first, though, well, now that's a different story. Or you can perform a cool setup where you catch the rear egg, then go into Wonder Wing, and time it so that the explosion happens while you're invincible and you're crossing up your opponent's shield. Actually, timing it with any kind of invincibility tends to work out really well. Like with a lot of item moves, there's tons of creative potential behind rear egg. It provides a much needed level of versatility that Banjo-Kazooie frequently lean on. Terry's moveset is… whew, something else. What am I choosing here? The invincible dive bomb that he combos into as a key part of his game plan? What about the comeback mechanic that covers half the stage and obliterates stocks? One of Ultimate's best burst movement tools that anti-airs, provides a massive recovery boost, is one of his staple combo extenders, and does almost 20 damage? Yeah, okay, that sounds pretty good. Crackshoot is far from the most stylish or dramatic attack in Terry's stylish, dramatic arsenal, but it's hard to overstate just how many situations it's good in. It comes out lightning quick and covers the perfect amount of space to catch everything from jump-ins to platforms. Terry's in the exclusive special cancel club alongside Ryu and Ken, and you know what you're canceling into a lot of the time? Crackshoot. You know what you're using to get out of disadvantage? Crackshoot. Neutral? Crackshoot. Recovery? Crack shoot. It's Little Max Jolt Haymaker, except for that whole only getting to use it once per air time thing. Crack shoot is refreshed every time Terry gets hit, like a normal recovery move. DLC. Okay, fine. To be fair, unlike Jolt Haymaker, Crackshoot doesn't kill very well, and that's basically the only knock against it I could find. Jab Jab Power Dunk is Terry's most famous combo, but in practice it's not insanely reliable, especially with SDI involved. You need to mix things up between that combo and Jab Jab Rising Tackle. I'd say the more impressive kill combos are actually the ones that end with Burning Knuckle, but that move has way less utility than either Crackshoot or Power Dunk. As for his Go Meter attacks, Power Geyser and Buster Wolf, they're fantastic, but he only gets them when he's taken 100 damage so they're not impactful enough. Terry has no shortage of good kill moves, but nothing quite compares to the utility that Crackshoot offers. Power Dunk isn't too far off, and again has good kill power that Crackshoot lacks, but it's way more reactable and not as flexible. Byleth was dubbed a distance demon upon reveal, and admittedly does have a lot of very good long-ranged moves, but for this video I've actually got to go with one of the stubbiest attacks in his arsenal, his bow twirling neutral air. Falling aerials that lead into kill setups aren't that uncommon, but ones that can be done rising and still confirm reliably are decidedly more rare. And all that it takes here is some good fastfall timing and the ability to track which side your opponent's gonna pop out of. Neutral air into dash attack is by far the most important of these confirms, and it works for a long time, although earlier on it can lead into itself and other moves as well, and in situations where there isn't enough space for the dash attack, neutral air into forward air is also a solid kill setup. Convenient, considering that a lingering, disjointed hitbox is exactly what you're looking to use for ledge trapping duties anyway. It's pretty good as an edge guarding move as well, it doesn't kill directly, but it's very easy to connect. While it may be visually similar to the pits, it actually has an appropriate hitbox! DLC. I hate this fucking game. Robbing an opponent of resources makes it easy to line up moves like one of Byleth's several spikes when they make their final attempt to return 
to the stage. While neutral air isn't technically the safest move on shield, it's way more oppressive than it first appears thanks to how long it lasts, giving Byleth a lot of leeway to mix up fastfall timings and drift, as well as having a landing hitbox on the ground. All of these are punishable if you're really prepared, but get your own timing wrong from inside the shield and suddenly things start going very badly for you. There are some matchups that neutral air alone can lock down shockingly well. I also considered up special for this slot, sort of the creator, easily Byleth's most eye-catching attack and one of his most notorious. It's an incredible recovery tool, an insta-kill edge guard with a generous hitbox, a planking option that makes it dangerous to try and ledge trap Byleth too closely, and leads into a lot of really nasty combos. Although those combos can be very susceptible to DI, and they never reach the sheer suffocation of neutral air. Min Min gets the longest forward smash in the game, then she makes it even longer, then she gets another one right behind it that can either cover even more space, including space way below the ledge, or cover less space but also packs brutal kill power. The fact that the entirety of the arms are also disjointed is broken to hell and back, and while abusing this disjoint is obviously the bulk of what Min Min does overall, Forward Smash puts its power on clear display. The best of these in order in my eyes would probably go Ram Ram for its coverage, then the Dragon, and then finally the Megawatt is the least versatile option, but who am I kidding? They're all amazing. The extra laser from the dragon is just fish cake on the ramen, and if Min Min lands a grab first, it even powers that laser up. She needs it. I'll keep this as simple as possible. Steve's neutral special is the best move in the game. I'm just referring to his ability to place blocks here, so we're clear. The other contextual use cases are more functionality things, and block placing is more than enough. In the neutral, Steve can use blocks to totally wall his opponent out of the game. Breaking the blocks becomes a necessity before they can even interact with Steve, and there are all sorts of ways that Steve can either set up to try and punish this, or just stay in the corner and mine for his best resources, like diamonds and iron. Blocks also help enable one of the strongest and most complex combo games that Ultimate has to offer, regardless of if you're a master of the character. Turns out that even basic platform ladders are pretty good if you're the one who gets to make the platforms. If you are strong with Steve, though, it only goes up from here, with advanced techniques like no-impact landings that allow him to act near instantly out of a block placement. He can post up underneath, or even above the stage, and continuously mine resources, which some characters have a lot of trouble dealing with. He can use blocks and disadvantage alongside moves like his minecart and down air to make him incredibly hard to track, despite his poor base movement stats. He can place blocks off stage to simply wall out a lot of recoveries, on top of all sorts of additional oddball interactions with Steve's other unusually complex tools. There are so many of these that trying to give something even resembling a comprehensive overview in this video just isn't gonna work. The seemingly mundane act of just placing a simple piece of terrain leads to more room for exploration than basically anything else in Ultimate. Maybe in Smash. Oh, and then just as this video is getting ready to go up, new block tech is discovered that means you can just cancel out of a bunch of hit stun stuff, so... Yay! Now the band Steve calls are starting up again. We'll see how that ages. Sephiroth had been a popular fan request for years before he finally made it into the series, but I've also heard many arguments that he'd feel out of place because of how comically over the top his sword is, and that it would just be too unwieldy for Smash. Welp. Ultimate threw that concern out the window a long time ago. He's here, so is his sword, and it does exactly what you'd expect, giving Sephiroth some outrageous hitboxes even by the standards of a game that ditched any kind of range constraints and his best move doesn't even use it. Neutral Air is another attack that's simple, but deceptively powerful, with a solid disjointed hitbox and knockback low enough to make it a staple combo starter. At early percents, it chains into itself, which can be extended very far if Sephiroth is in the one-wing form that grants him another jump, and works in tandem with his sword for a long time after that, notably creating a kill confirm into back air. Sephiroth does play a spacing game, as expected, but platform fighters like Smash are full of mobile characters, he can't keep them out forever, especially considering that many of his longest moves are also pretty skinny. Neutral Air is by far his biggest saving grace up close, and the reward is strong enough that it's what he's actively looking for a lot of the time. Part of the strength of his larger hitbox is his coaxing opponents into patterns that he can exploit. It's true that Neutral Air's reward disappears at hypersense and it just starts popping opponents in a disadvantaged state, but that's a scenario that Sephiroth is very well set up to capitalize on. He's another character where I'd love to choose one of his more distinctive and interesting moves, which he's got a fair amount of, but the next in line was another very simple one, Back Air. It's the most prominently used attack at the longer range you'd expect of him. Sephiroth gameplay frequently turns into fishing for back air kills later on, and there's no point in the game where you won't see him using it a lot. When pitting the two aerials head to head though, I'd say that back air comes with a bit more flaws. While both moves require some precision, back air is slow and precise enough that lining it up can be tricky even among the best and most experienced Sephiroth players in the world. And it has multiple hitboxes with varying strengths, the best of which is on the middle of the sword, which means that you have to sacrifice some safety to get the most out of it. Back air still probably comes into 
to play more overall, but this is also because Sephiroth is a character who's forced into a lot of anticipating and picking his positioning extremely carefully. The move is good in this role, but retreating back air alone is not a game plan, and it plays into his inability to scrap, which also applies to moves like forward air and forward tilt that can partially replace what back air is trying to do. Neutral air, in comparison, plugs a key weakness of Sephiroth's up, and there's nothing else on his kit that really does the same thing. Both aerials are obviously strong tools, don't get me wrong. I think whether we're evaluating the individual quality of the moves or how they fit into Sephiroth's game plan, though, neutral air pulls ahead. Pyra and Mithra continue on the legacy of Sheik and Zelda with their specialized duo design, except elevated to even higher extremes where Pyra exists almost entirely for the sake of taking stocks. She's really good at this across the board, but down air has to be singled out. It's big by any standard, but for a down air, it's outrageous, so much so that it's one of the few in its move slot that sees regular use as a neutral tool, and the majority of that giant hitbox is also a spike. This means that whether she's covering an opponent trying to get back to the stage, or she's using it on stage to convert into one of her numerous devastating finishers, it provides some of the highest reward she has access to, which is saying a lot, while also being an easy move to line up. As for Mithra, she's certainly the more combo-centric of the duo, and long chains into the air are her bread and butter at early percents, but I'd say her actual most important role is winning neutral. Even at high percents when an opponent is ready to lose their stock, you'll still regularly see Mithra stay out to put opponents in a disadvantaged state, then Pyra comes down after that's been achieved. Winning neutral isn't that hard with a lot of Mithra's moves, but if I've got to pick one that puts in the most work, it'd probably be neutral air. Frame made is a generous startup time for how much space this covers, and it's in the same camp as Bylus, where the safety on shield is technically not that great, but gets helped by timing mix-ups and a landing hitbox. And if it connects, it reliably pays off, initiating the ubiquitous early damage that opponents basically just have to accept eating at the start of their stock, because she's gonna pull it off somehow, and then later on still eating into good stuff like Lightning Buster. Whether you're looking for moves that easily win neutral, moves that lead to good combos, or both, Mithra has a lot of excellent options to pull from, but neutral air is definitely one of the attacks that she leans on most. <gasps> Neutral air loops, where Sora just takes you for a ride across the stage, and there's theoretically not much that you can do about it. You can't DI them because you're not put into tumble, and you can't really SDI them either because of how little time you're in hit lag for, just a whole lot of hit stun and a whole lot more praying. Now, in practice, Sora isn't always getting these massive chains. Being able to do this relies on hitting the noop box, a single small hitbox among many that's active for exactly one frame and grants a boatload of extra hit stun compared to anything else for some reason. What's much more common to see are shorter combos that either end in neutral air's natural finisher or some other move. Fortunately, that's still very, very good. It helps that neutral air is also easy to land, as a massive sword aerial that covers Sora's entire body, a body that can stay in the air for a long time thanks to his exaggeratedly floaty physics. These physics also make it really easy to control his drift and mix up all three of the hits on shield for a degree of safety beyond what you'd expect of the move's frame data. Even the basic version of neutral air is amazing, and if that was all he had, then fishing for it would still be a major part of Sora's game plan. But when connecting it can just straight up end stocks, yeah, good move. Speaking of good moves, that's everyone's best move done, so what did we end up with here? At least according to me, a character's best move is most likely to be their neutral air or their neutral special, both of which come in with a whopping count of 14. Given that neutral airs are often among the fastest and most versatile of what's already a strong category of move, no big surprises there. The same applies to neutral specials and the way they're typically designed. 11 out of the 14 of these are many of Ultimate's best projectiles, another inherently powerful type of move, and two of the remaining three are major centerpieces of their character's kits that I'd possibly considered to be the best two moves in Ultimate period, Peach's float being the other contender in my eyes as I did count it. And finally, if we put everything together, the trend continues and we get a chart that looks like this. Who was the grappler player that beat Sakurai in 2018? Fess up! Thanks for watching everyone and let me know what you thought of the list. Likes and comments play a big part in whether YouTube recommends videos to larger audiences, so if you think it's deserved, much appreciated. You can check out another full roster video here, video on my second channel Mock Rock Talk here, and patrons, YouTube members, and Twitch subs get perks like early videos and Discord access. Later people!